How are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode four of the Simple Life podcast with your host, Simple Carter, and as always, joining me, Mr. Maka MC. I hope you are all having a lovely evening. Or daytime. Or no, daytime. Of the yeah. day, or whatever time you're choosing to listen to this. Okay. Um, we are joined uh, today by a very special guest, Dr. Callie Seaman, PhD. Um, she's a formulation chemist with 20 years' experience in the hydro industry. I've uh, been looking forward to having this chat for quite a while now. Um, but for people that don't know that are listening and watching this, Callie, could you give a brief summation of sort of who you are and what you're doing here today? Well, so, uh, yeah, as you introduced me, Dr. Callie Seaman, um, got into the hydro industry 20 years due to my dad and my epilepsy. Um, diagnosed at the age of 15 and uh, kind of went from there. Went to work for the... Um, pharmaceutical industry, GSK, and absolutely hated it, decided I didn't want to do it. I thought that's what, you know, my life goal was going to be, go to uni, go to work at a big pharmaceutical company. Yeah, a year later, decided not to. and went into the hydro industry because it's a really special industry, and anybody who's part of that knows that it's full of everyone who is isn't employed by anywhere else, who doesn't fit in anywhere else, where the misfits, where the... The oddballs, but there's some amazing people there, and I've been in there ever since. And in the last kind of two to three years, I've got into what we call the medical side of cannabis. Um, went in with a very different opinion to what I have now, three years later, having experienced it all. Um, so yeah, that's me in a bit of a nutshell, really. Well, I think it was a perfect summation. Thank you very much. Uh, also leads on quite well to our first uh, question, which you answered um, a little bit there, which is how and why did you sort of get involved in the industry? Obviously, you've alluded to your um, sort of childhood epilepsy. And um, could you sort of explain a little bit more? So, well, really, my dad has always smoked cannabis. From being little, it was always daddy's backy, and it was what we didn't talk <laughs> about. We just didn't, didn't talk about it. But they didn't drink. That wasn't what they did. They just, and it was, you know, I went to school, and I was a bit of the odd kid. So I was always that hippie kid that always wearing the tie-dye, always had the funny hats, the Dr. Martin boots on, just, you know, that, that odd one. And mm. didn't really realise that not everybody else's family smoked cannabis. That wasn't normal. Well, I thought it mm. was. Um, but back then it was, it was obviously resin and soap bar. So it was a very different kind of world then. But at the age of 15, my dad took me to the local hydro shop. Uh, I don't know if you know the one, um, Aquaculture, which was down by Bramall Lane. It was a back street kind of, it was just a door and you walked in it. And then there was all these plants growing and all these weird and wonderful things. And that's where it really started. Um, four years later, went to uni, walked upstairs into this house and looked out the, this window. It was in the attic and I saw aquaculture was there and I had to live there. It was, oh my God, this is where I'm supposed to live. And then got to know the boys working in the shop. And as I say, I, I finished off my degree and part of that, I did this placement at GlaxoSmithKline and I just didn't fit in there. I was just not part of it. I was a number. I didn't, it didn't feel right. And But this is what I'd always dreamed of growing up. I wanted to set up Fixed Pharmaceuticals when I was at school. That was my kind of dream. And went and went, no, this is not for me. And then I, as I say, started working for uh, aquaculture as a Saturday girl and just didn't leave. It was just <laughs> I felt part of this family, a part of this amazing kind of culture that was... I could be myself. I didn't have to hide. I mean, I spent all the time at uni, obviously, with my friends, you know, sharing um, my experiences. But at uni, I kept very quiet. And shortly after I graduated, I became a mum. And then that's when I really became shut down massively about any consumption of cannabis. You couldn't talk about that. You would have your child taken off of you. Mm. Um, and But my dad, when I was younger... Um, when I was 15, I was actually diagnosed 
with epilepsy. It happened at school and in front of the whole school. And I was put onto drugs very, very quickly. I was put onto clomazepine really quickly because I was I remember being sat there with this nurse and she just she said, if you don't take these tablets, you can't carry on doing all the things you do. I was an active teenager. I was a sea cadet. I was going sailing. I was yeah, I'm sailing. I was off out everywhere. And all of a sudden she was saying to me, no, you've got, you can't do that now. Mm. Or if you take these tablets, you can. So what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you also you trust a health professional, you know, somebody that's official and is supposed to have your um, best um, best intentions in mind, you know? Yep. My dad sat there and just didn't like it. He sat there going, you've not asked anything about her lifestyle. You know nothing about her. You just, yeah, take these drugs, have the blood tests every three months, come back, tell us how it's going. I went from a straight A student and became a sort of average CD student, struggled through my A levels until I came off of the camazepine at 17. Felt completely off my face all the time. But my dad encouraged me to consume cannabis at that point. He, he then grew for me and um, he grew for himself as well. But he would ne- always make sure I had a smoke. So I went to uni, discouraged me from drinking, always made sure I had a smoke got this, make sure you consume it. Yeah. And it was, I didn't actually realise I was using it for my epilepsy. It was, well, I enjoyed doing it. It was mm. better than getting drunk. I got into less trouble, less, you know, reckless times as you do <laughs> with that age. Yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, you, you, you remain in control, a lot more in control and you become a little bit paranoid and that paranoia could actually save you from making a real tit of yourself. That's me yeah. anyway. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how I got into the industry. It was I became that Saturday girl and never left. So, so when you said you were oh. in your head the, the whole time, like with under under this, it sounds like a um, a tranquilizer. Um, like I'm not sure what, what what did you call it? What was the medication? Camazepine. Camazepine. All right. So, what was that like when you were taking it? Like, I mean, it obviously, sort of had some sort of level of incapacitation that affected your education quite clearly. That's what you're saying. But, I mean, how would you describe it? Subdued. Right. Um, no, just not fully there. So there was no kind of euphoric feeling to it. It right. wasn't. It wasn't like you know having an A. It was. I mean, I found out now that it's used regularly in the the clubs. And I'm thinking, well, it wasn't that good. I mean, I felt subdued yeah. and certainly not myself. I I went through sort of a quite an abusive relationship that was quite, I, I was very submissive as well. I wasn't the person I was. I wasn't this outgoing girl. I wasn't this ready to take on the world. And then when I stopped taking that, she bursted out again. She wow. put all her hair off and she became, I'm going to take over the world again and got rid of the boyfriend I had at the time and... But I suppose I was 18 as well, and you're changing a lot when you're, you know, you're that age. Mm. You're becoming yourself. Um, but I swore I would never take them again, ever, ever again. I mean, they've tried to put me back on them again um, because I didn't have another fit until I was 35. Um, that was when I was doing my PhD and finishing it off, and I'd stopped consuming because I needed to clear my head and I was writing up. Yeah, that didn't do a lot of good, did it? I ended up having a big fit at work because I was stressed and it was a hot day and smashed my face up. So still in denial at this point. (laughs) Um, I then decided to get fitter and started to train for a half marathon. And again, stopped consuming. Two days after the half marathon, I had another fit and at that point came out of denial and decided that, yeah, you need to actually continue to consume this and actually really educate yourself on it. I got very mad about talking about epilepsy. I still do. Um, But when I came out of that denial, I was able to read about it. I was then able to look at cannabis more closely to see how it could help and what benefited me and how I could look at those strains. I mean, I'd spent years teaching people how to grow and we'd had, you know, grandparents coming in who'd got um sorry no you're all right all right you're grand you're grand there's no hassle. no hassle. Right, so that's part of it um <laughs> i get stutters um all good so we we have uh, we had uh, we had this uh, older gentleman used to come in the shop and his wife was she had cancer and he needed to do something about it and he 
I showed him how to grow, set up a little tent. And he kept coming back. And every time he got another crop out, it kept him going. Um, but she passed away in the end. But it was, I just kind of ignored it as a, had medicinal properties. I just used it to relax at night. That's, mm. you know, instead of drinking, I didn't drink. It wasn't interest me yeah. so when you actually come out of those denial it allowed me to sort of say oh right let's start looking into this more and then want to teach other people and want to help other people and want to remove that stigma I lived in a lot of fear for a lot of my life that my dad would be taken away from me because of this plant that's wrong um, yeah. that's wrong and I, I, I want to share my story speak up for others Make sure other mothers don't feel ashamed because they consume. There's absolutely nothing wrong yeah. with it. You're still a good mum. You're not a bad person. And I felt like a bad person for so long. And it's that is now what I want to help change. Yeah, we, it's, it's interesting that, I mean, you talk about the detrimental effect that these prescribed medications had on you uh, at such a young age. And yet we still have this conversation of moralizing around kids using cannabis, whether it be for medicinal purpose or even just smoking a bit on the street, which frankly, I did it 14, 15, you know what I mean? And I would state that it did mean virtually no harming, especially in comparison to the random medications that I would find in my mother's drawer and go, oh, what's this? Give it a quick Google or side effects. That sounds like it'll be a fun Friday. Mix it, <laughs> mix it in with a bit of cider. You know what I mean? It's so, yeah. So it's, it, and it's about the exposure of it. So you've just said with your father there, I mean, we worry about saying the parents shouldn't then be self-sufficient. Your father t took an active decision to remove himself from a criminal marketplace, be self-sufficient, pay tax on all of the products that he needed to produce that plant, not steal his electric. You know what I mean? Go to the point of then ensuring that his daughter was then self-sufficient as well. That is that is a good person in anybody's eyes or measure. Once you remove that stigma and that moralizing from cannabis, which, as you said, it may have taken you till your, your mid-30s to do so fully. Um, I mean, can you imagine what it could have been like if you didn't have that societal pressure on you to stop it so you could finish your PhD, to stop it so you could run a marathon. When we, what we actually know now about say cannabis as being a bronchial dilator, it, it can help with runners. We actually know now the runner's high is just an endogenous cannabinoid high. You know what I mean? It's, it's all just so, we're getting more and more information every, every damn day. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you, you went down the uh, uh, hydro industry route, but I would also, it would have been good to have a person like you on the inside in the farmer industry at this point. Because it he wouldn't have listened to me. But the good, yeah. I was I was a number, and that was it. You're a number. They want you to do. You're a lab rat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 and I was. Yeah. I can believe that definitely. Yeah. Exactly. And you know what? And then they'll just replace you in, in what in three four days. Do you know that kind of way? They'll have somebody else in. So that's 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 the nature of the beast, unfortunately. So yeah, you, I, 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 yeah, I would definitely believe you when you say that. Well, I, I was in the company. I was in. It was. I got the job with Beecham's and they were just merging with Glaxo. So I saw that merger occur and I saw people lose their jobs. I saw people that had been there whose lives had been turned upside down. They, they, the stability, they just got mortgages. And I just felt that this was not something I wanted to be part of. That mm. these, It just felt wrong. And when I joined, when I joined Aquaculture, it was... I, I felt like I I would I found my family and it was it was amazing and it was sad to see that disappear but there were some amazing people come from that company. Um, do you know Eco Thrive? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I love for Eco Thrive. Uh, they're br he's brilliant. You need to get him on. He really knows his stuff when it comes to microbes. Um, but he came from there, and there's so many people came from there. And this is something I also want to stand up for for when I've actually gone into this medicinal side of things, how the hydro industry has been completely ignored. There's all of this, this uh, there's all of this knowledge, amazing knowledge and connoisseurs that have been completely ignored and shunned and being called the black market. And it's, hold on yeah. a minute. This, this industry isn't in its infancy. This industry has been around for decades. You've just decided that it's just been invented. This, I've turned 40 lately and decided that I've got to speak up about this and stop sitting in the shadows. I mean, watching you go on and, you know, giving the full bore rants and going, no, you shouldn't hide, made me go, no, you're right, actually. It's about time I'd stood up and said something. And I know I've got letters after my name and it's opened doors that I couldn't see before. So I'm going to kick them down and I'm going to go in and I'm going to present the case and try and change things. Cool. <sighs> Hopefully.
<laughs> well, I've got all faith in you. I really do. Um, and it, it, it's part of the, the whitewashing, the uh, gentrifying that we're seeing of the industry is that, yeah, exactly that. The treating it as if, I mean, yeah, it's only the 90s that we discovered um, the, the start of cannabinoids and most of the research has kicked off in the past 30 years. Um, but even before that, as you say, we've had a certain knowledge of this, not just in terms of actual uh, research and documented medicine, but just in practice within our community. There are people that have been growing to provide cannabis oil for cancer patients in the 60s and 70s, long before this was even a twinkling in, in anybody's eyes. You know what I mean? So I, I agree. It's not only the expertise, but it's the infrastructure. I, I speak to quite a lot of the Northern Hydro um, shops and spend quite a bit of time in them because, again, I find them so welcoming. And the people you meet are the most unique people you will ever meet anywhere in the world. And they live in such ways that often they're off the grid because they're, they're, they've been in this for 20, 30 years and they, they haven't seen the world that I've grown up in. I'm very lucky that I'm articulate and I'm, I'm white and that I at least appear in my lifestyle to be middle class. So that they kind of just discredit me, they discount me altogether. So I'm not a threat. But yeah, the, the, the knowledge base there, it, it's so disheartening to see this kind of polarizing and binary um, debate within the industry. I suppose this actually brings us on quite nicely to another question I've got for you then, which is um, medical versus recreational. I hate both terms really, but in terms of a, a debate title, it works quite well. I want to throw a third type in there. I want to throw clinical in there. Ooh, right. 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 This what is being prescribed that is of known concentrations, everything I believe is clinical and is used in a clinical setting. So if you've been prescribed it, that should be called clinical cannabis. Anybody using cannabis for anything from anxiety is medical cannabis. Right? There's, there's, it's medical cannabis. And there's recreational people use it to relax. Where's the problem with that? We, stop, we need to stop putting this ashamedness. That's not even a word, a shameless. Go with it. Uh, shame. I make up words all the time. <laughs> Go with it. Yeah. Shame, sorry. <laughs> on um, you know, relaxing, getting stoned. It's quite it's quite acceptable for the mums in the playground to talk about mummy needing her glass of wine. And that's fine if you want to do that, love. Fine if you want to take the diazepam. Fine if, if that's what you want to do. I'm about pro-choice, and you should be able to choose what you put into yourself and you should be able to choose how, what medicine you use so if that's you choose to use cannabis you shouldn't be demonized for that if you want the pharmaceuticals that's brilliant as well you know if, if that works for you what i want to see and where i'm really kind of focusing a lot of my attention now is medcan support which is about supporting parents with children with refractory epilepsy mm -hmm. that needs very specific ratios now i even know when i change strains I can cause myself to have a fit. I know there are particular strains which will cause more auras in me. So for these children to have a change in their medication and it not to be precisely made causes problems. So that's what I call clinical cannabis. This is very, very pure, known. Yes, it's expensive because there's a lot of analysis goes in it. There's a lot of work goes into it. But I believe that medicinal is any cannabis that is used by anyone to treat any ailment. Yeah, I concur wholeheartedly. Um, anybody that's obviously seen or heard me speak at any point, in, at any point really, will have, will have heard my, my views on this, that ultimately, yeah, every person that consumes cannabis, the cannabinoids that they're consuming supplement their endocannabinoid system. It has anti-inflammatory effects. It reduces stress and anxiety. As you said, it, it helps uh, cause metacognition and introspection. It helps people become sort of, frankly, the opportunity to become better people. As you said, people, some people get a bit of paranoid. I think that's a limitation in language because paranoid is quite a diverse term. There's negative and positive on it. And some of the, the um, positive paranoia you get from cannabis is that introspection, is that, oh, shit, am I, what am I doing? Where am I? And you actually address where you are in your life and get the option, possibly for the first time in your life, to choose what direction you want. So I, I agree. I think this debate around it is, is bollocks. And the way that the industry is pushing it at the minute is that's pharmaceutical grade cannabis that is growing to the pharmaceutical standards. But even then we've seen pictures from large crops around the world with spider mites, with molds, with mm. serious problems. And then we've got an issue within something you'll speak, I'm sure far better than me on in a moment, uh, within the nutrient industry, with deliberate mislabeling, with, with, mm. company, with companies adding in things that 
are incre incredibly dangerous for human consumption. And we haven't even considered, and a lot of them haven't done any research on volatization. So when you actually combust these products that are then left over within the plant, it then breaks them down into further chemicals, which we then still don't know the potential for that. So I agree in terms of sort of children of very specific ailments that need very specific ratios or terpene, flavonoid, cannabinoid combinations, that should come from that side of it, or at least have that regulation that step-by-step -step accountable system whereas then again a, a medicinal account somebody that's just got anxiety yeah they should be able to get access but they then need to be taught about terpenes about flavonoids yeah. Yeah, about yeah, yeah. Re reactions you know i mean yeah. it's pointless as just saying that all cannabis is medical and then somebody yeah. that has a severe anxiety disorder now going and getting some say lemon haze or something and the lemonine in it making them very more jittery and a bit you know it's going to really turn them off to the, to the point whereas if you give them something far more sedatory, gassy, I suppose, in the old vernacular, indicary. Do you know what I mean? It, yeah. it will it will help them slow down a bit and they'll, that positive paranoia will allow them to actually think about what they're thinking about and they'll have a more beneficial outcome. Yeah, the edge... Oh. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, totally. I, I, I mean, I came into this, you know, as I say, two or three years ago going, yes, regulations, what's needed? No, I think it's transparency and availability of testing so that we know yes, what's in yes. the product. And, and, and I wish I could have accessibility to knowing exactly, you know, between crops as well, understanding what, what, what causes that change in terpene profile. Is it that, you know, that it was summer and the temperatures were slightly up so that you got those differences between day and night? Was it the fact that, you know, that there was a, a change in light ratio? You know, mm -hmm. But you don't know. Because yeah. there isn't the availability of the labs. I mean, I, I would love to see where we get to the point where you can go to your doctor with a sample and say, right, I'm treating this disorder with it. And I've got this problem. I've, this is the sample. This is the, the, the batch that I've been using. Send it off for testing. Put it on my records to show the cannabinoid profile, show that terpene profile, look at the flavonoids as well. And then they can put that on. Rather yeah, yeah. than we shouldn't be scared to do that and, and provide Man. all of that information to to public domain, like do you know that kind of way. So that yeah. do you know that kind of way? I think that that's it, it, the education needs to be provided at any what it, any categorical separation. If you want, if if that's what we end up with, do you know what I mean? Even if it's a if it's a decriminalized home grow or something like that. You need to know how to do that safety. You need to know, you know, the kind of way, how to set up the electrics, how to how to do how to avoid, you know, all of the things that we've seen these pharmaceutical industries yeah. struggle with, which are doing you know, mites and stuff like that. Basically, well, a, lo a lot of this I would say then comes from these this pool of experts or the, this pool of let's call them professional weirdos. I would count myself in that group, right? yeah. so it's not not derogatory. I apologize if anybody hears it says so. Um, but they need to be welcomed within this because until we have this, nobody's considering half of these problems because they don't know it's problems because they're just starting up, putting a couple of million down in, in a few hundred thousand square foot uh, acreage, growing shitload of plants and then going, why is the strain variance? And going, oh, actually we used about a hundred different seeds. Well, then you've got cultivar variants within that. You know what I mean? So it's about teaching them the practices to actually be able to standardize. We're never going to be able to truly standardize cannabis and well, I, I agree with you entirely. We need local testing. So my vision was always the clubs. Cannabis, you do go into a cannabis club where you can buy weed, but you've got to bring your weed, use their spectrometer for free, find out exactly what you've got and, and go, go from there. You know what I mean? The same with testing for molds and for pesticides and for fertilizers. Unless we, I mean, the equipment is there. It's just the, the willingness really isn't because the, I yeah. feel that the industry as a whole doesn't want to empower the individual. Well, being a data nerd, I'm, I, just to add on to that step, it's very fucking important that if we have these little um, testing facilities or whatever, or um, to actually really collate that they collect that data and have it readily fucking available. Do you know that kind of way? Because mm -hmm. then you, what, what you will end up with is a best practices, a safe practices for the different levels of, you know, because let's be honest with you, like, um, even though we don't want any sort of categorical, categorical separation, uh, like into the medical um, category, right? Um, particularly um, because, you know, cannabis is cannabis, blah, 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 blah. But we will have medical application for that, just as you said, you know, and to, to have that broadened down to a level of anxiety, uh, treat, treating anxiety, 
that's that's welcome okay that's fair enough I'm, I'm happy with that medical application and i'm happy to have any sort of taxation or any sort of um, money go to the research to supplement that to to progress it to to have it um as to to, to i suppose to sort of get us to a stage where we don't have to keep faffing around with these small systems do you get me does that make sense yeah. I'll, I'll shut up there because I can just keep going. No, there. no, it's patent removal I want to see. They should not be allowed patents on uh, compounds. It, it, it should be patients before patents, and that is happening so much. I mean, there was there was a project I'd seen that was about using yeast to produce cannabinoids, yeah. and the concept was fantastic. It's like trace cannabinoids such as THCV could be produced massively, but then... Are they going to put a patent on THCV because it's produced by this organism? Does that mean then that compound is only allowed to be sold by one company or producers? And I do not agree with that. And this is in some ways why I move away from the bigger companies because it's all about the patents. These smaller yeah. little farms are lovely. They, they are about just being able to make themselves self-sufficient, trying to get themselves going. The bigger farms are a different ball game, the, and, and it's about protecting their money and investment. And yeah, not right. We uh, yeah, you've articulated beautifully. It should be, uh, I suppose, pa patience over patents, as you've said. Um, <laughs> this is entirely what it is. It's future. They're hedging it on future profits, not current benefits, not the people's lives that they could help. You know, all of these these companies that are then spending collectively probably billions at this point on research and development, um, the way that it works ultimately is the compounds themselves, if they exist in nature, I believe they can't be patented. It is all to do with the extraction process. So so it's the, the way that they create novel processes. And what some of the big companies do is they create their process and then several other processes and they patent everything and only produce theirs on. So I made this point uh, in 2018, just before it went medical. I said, okay, does that mean uh, GW are going to come at me for using um, uh, for, for using a tincture? Do, do you know what I mean? Because they've got a patent on a tincture, but the way that it works is their process. So it's, it's the process they extracted, but it's also the end product. So as long as I don't mimic their process and produce the same end product, then it's not infringing on their intellectual property. So this is one thing that yeah, I was very worried about. And this brings us on beautifully to our next conversation, which is um, discussing raw cannabis versus CBMPs, cannabis-based medicinal products. Because one thing that really worries me is I'm a sucker for legalese and for, for pronouns and what we've got now, proper nouns, sorry. What we've currently got is a hyphenated and uh, commoned medical cannabis, which is effectively a compound word, which now means they've created just for the schedule two so schedule two is medicinal cannabis but it's not it's cannabis based medicinal products designed for human consumption that is the lettering of the the, the wording on it so i just wanted to get sort of your opinion obviously from your background as to uh a what do you think is going to win out and sort of um do you think there needs to be a battle at all between raw cannabis and these cannabis based products I think it sh I'm about pro-choice. So if you want raw cannabis, you should be allowed raw cannabis. If you want these cannabis-based medicines that you feel are going to make you better, they should be available. I think everything should be available. It, I mean, you've spoken previous kind of talks. I, mean, I, I watched the one with um, Phil Monk this morning. You were talking about all drugs actually being, uh, the prohibition being lifted on them. And it should be pro-choice about people wanting to take what they want to take. Everything should be available. Um, what I can see what the government will like will be CM, you know, cannabis-based medicines. Because yeah. it's controllable, it's individual compounds, it's less lawsuits because what they classify a lot of everything else that's within raw cannabis is contaminants. All they want to know about is CBD, THC, and that's it. That's all they're interested in. Everything else is a contaminant. So for them to regulate it and understand it, it will be easier for these isolates and the cannabis-based medicines to come through. And that's what I suspect will happen in this country, unfortunately. But they're never going to get rid of the Grow Your Own movement. God, they've not got rid of it in 30 years. So do you think they're going to stop yeah. now? They haven't they exactly that. I don't believe that they have a chance at all. Um, it's it's more it's it's easier than ever. As you say, you can literally walk into your local hydro shop, buy everything you need. Some of them are even selling seeds now. You know what I mean? You can literally get whatever you need. They will give you as long as some of them, as long as you talk about tomatoes, 
they'll give you the, all the advice you need of how to get your ripest, juiciest tomatoes out of this crop. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so, you know what I mean? So, so For the record, get, um, I actually do grow tomatoes, so fuck you. <laughs> do you know how many times I've had that conversation with them? Um, and your tomatoes, the flower sets, uh, are they um, changing colour? Do they look mature? Uh, kind of, yeah. And the amount of time... I mean, I've got easy with it. I've not worked in grow shops now for seven, eight years because we started Aqualabs seven mm. years ago. So I've actually not really been what you would call on the coal face for that long. Yeah. Um, so the, the, it, they've changed a lot as well in that time. Growing methodology has changed a lot as well. When I first yeah. got into it, it was NFT. Everybody was growing NFT, 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 NFT. And then it changed over to cocoa and soil. And then there was, because there was, there was the big perception that cocoa is organic because it's brown. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. It's washed in calcium nitrate and it's, you know, it's been buffered. So just because it's brown doesn't make it organic. I mean, hydroponics, I'm a hydroponic specialist. So it's a very efficient way of using water if done correctly, a very efficient way of using nutrients, and you're in control of what you put in there. Yeah. I mean, there's talk of this, oh, you've got to flush them in the last weeks to get any of the nasty chemicals out. Like if you didn't put the nasty chemicals in to start off with, you wouldn't need to push that. And mm, once it's in there, it ain't coming out. You're just starving the plant and you're wasting your money putting extra nutrients in. So can you stop telling me that you're going to get white or black ash because you've not flushed it properly? The, the, yeah, so the white, the white ash thing is, is done me for a while because anyone that's grown, <laughs> basically you can watch it. So if you try and smoke it after three days, it's going to be black. You give it five, six days, it's going to be gray. You give it a week or so of, dry, of good dry and pushing the cure, you're going to get white ash. There's the debate around it. It's all it's marketing gimmicks. And I think that's probably what happened is we saw is, let's look back at it, actually. You could probably plot the start of social media to this, <laughs> this change of it. Because again, it's, so I mean, I currently, the Simple Life podcast, shout out to the Simple Life podcast on Instagram, um, and my Cumberan page, I will get maybe 30 to 40 a day of these fake Instagram accounts and they'll put a, a, uh, a comment on one of the images saying uh, Wick Kicker and it's uh, got all their like shit down on it's in, it's in uh, LSD pills with, with yeah, oh, Have you started months. getting that one? Oh, we, I've had them for a good fucking five, five, six months but you can see how then the, that's now the dealers getting really getting smart with it and getting getting onto it and using it as a because they're tracing hashtags and whatnot. So, so I can imagine that the infancy of this, when others found out, like when the grow forums, they've been going for a long time, when the internet started in the uh, mid nineties, there were grow forums. Do you know what I mean? And some of them are still going, you know what I mean? These people have this, this community. And I, that's one of the things that I, I advocate and fight for ultimately is that we don't get lost in any law change or any cultural change, because if we're not accepted back into the fold, then we're going to keep fighting that they can legalize and do whatever they want and write whatever rules, but we will still fight. If they announce tomorrow that they're going to legalize and with no home grow, there's going to be a million plus people in this country still going, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to stop them overnight. It, it really isn't. And, and it, it's something that I've had to always watch my tongue with because I didn't want to, you know, lose my business. But I've, I've got to the point now of going, no, I've got to stand up. I've just turned 40 and it's now time to start saying something and standing up for what I actually believe in. It, it's took me a long time and it was it was programming and it's kept it kept me safe. My mum and dad programmed me not to talk about it from so little. And, and it, it, it was loose lip sync ships. You don't talk about it, Callie. But now it's time to talk about it. My son's now 16. They can't take him off of me. They can, they can try. What, and, and I think that was a big thing for me as my son turning 16. And it's like, now, right, what? Well, come on then, throw it at me. What are you going to do? Come on. Yeah. Um, I mean, I went to see my local MP really thinking, right, no, I'm going to do this proper way. He gave me lip service and I've heard nothing from him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think the MP situation is, uh, what's that quote? Um, how can you get a man to understand something when his salary is based on him not understanding it? And that's basically the position when we're the MPs is because of the whip system and the way that the two party system works in this country and the fact that neither one wants to be the one that truly gives in, even though if you actually talk very quietly out of closed chambers with the majority, in fact, every high end police officer, uh, high sort of up in the rank police officer or politician I've spoke to anywhere 
very quietly of like, yeah, 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 to all drugs, to like the whole thing's a charade and it's bullshit. As soon as they step up to the pulpit, no, because they still think it's a vote winner. They still believe this shit that if they look tough on drugs, when actually the generation that they're trying to, to stop taking drugs are taking drugs because of the consequences of what happened to their parents' generation. Do you know what I mean? It's the reason the world is so fucked. There's a consequence of prohibition. The economics, the, the economy, the social structures, all of this has been irrevocably disrupted by prohibition. Couldn't agree more. And, and well, the opiate addiction, the, the, the opiate pandemic that's occurred, that the, it's perfectly okay because the doctors gave it me. That's not a, that's not a drug. I know yeah. that was given to me by the doctor. That's perfectly fine. Um, I've got, I've got a friend who she'd had problems over the years, been a heroin addict, then ended up uh, an alcoholic and going to AA. And I said to her, so if you stop taking, you know, you gabapentin and your tramadol, Oh, no, no, they don't count. What do you mean they don't yeah. count? They're, 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 they're pharmaceutical grade up. They're better than anything you'll they've get got, on the street. They've got the blue tick, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> Verified. Yeah. And, and this is what needs educating. We need to talk more about the pharmaceutical drugs and the damage that they do in schools than heroin and speed. Well, everyone knows what they're going to do. You know, and let's talk more about all the, the, the actual beneficial effects of some of these drugs. I mean, you speak quite openly about MDMA. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that there's actually, you know, 124 different MDA compounds, each one having a different effect on you. Sorry. Marvelous, marvelous book. You need to get PCAL. You must have heard of it, Simpa. I think it's third shelf down on the right. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Have you got TCAL next to it as well? I, I haven't. I actually picked a peak. I got it. I walked past a charity shop and it was 50 pence in a box out the front of it. Right, context for and, people. Yeah, yeah. Context for people, please. Um, it's Alex and Sasha, uh, Alex and, what's it called? Alexander Shulgun and Anne Shulgun. Anne and Shulgun, that was the other one. The, Alexander, the couple. A chemical love story. Alexander is a chemist, a synthetic chemist, and he started off, um, he carried on the work from that was done on ergot and uh, LSD, and he carried on that, and he went on, on to synthesise his own compounds. He'd, he'd actually put, got a lab in his own shed at the bottom of the garden, and his wife was a psychologist. So they worked together, and it was a, it's a fabulous book. You've got to read this book, because it goes through them, and, and how he worked, I think, was it ICI, or... It was a big drug company he worked for, and they basically gave him a license to do what he wanted to do. He did this, and then they had no use for him anymore, so he set his lab up at home and carried on. But he'd have his own... I'm not going to use the word session because it doesn't sound very... <laughs> but basically, he had loads of sessions. And his wife would then actually do the psychology, so he would take a sample, see what was doing, then give a sample oh. to Am, and she would go, oh, yeah, this is working. Let's get everyone round. And then they would sort of is log it... it and talk about it, and it goes into two CBs as well and the two right. CLs, and it goes to all the different compounds. And this is why some people will say, oh, I had a really bad experience. I took pills, and it's like, well, do you know exactly what you're talking? How much? <laughs> yeah. you, you know, did, did you have a two CB? Because I know some people have gone just, oh, up the wall because they have thought that they've had some MDMA and it's now it's been a two CB and it's the, the so is he, is he similar enough to or are they similar enough to sort of a Tim, Timothy Leary sort of sculling shots of of LSD straight like whiskey in, in whiskey Wait, glasses he, and stuff yeah they, they, there's a lot of stuff that I imagine will have been kept out of the books but the modern myths around them would very much allure to that yeah um, it's some something we, we will have to do at some point Macca is have a purely psychedelic podcast coming in the next few episodes where we we cover some of this because the yeah yeah the the, the un, un fucking believable but effectively um it created the abcs of of modern synthetics which right. again part of that is again a consequence of prohibition because again if all these substances were allowed to be sort of freely available we wouldn't then have these novel compounds i mean what we had until the the arms race in this country until 2017 which was a compound hit the street for as a legal high and then once they've moved the legal high system, they tried to get rid of them and uh, cl start classifying compounds. They could only do one compound at a time. So they'd grab a compound, go shit, chemist to go, someone like yourself, oh, just change this molecule, boom, out on the street again. And it was just going, so there was hundreds, thousands of them just kept appearing. It was just different variants until the, uh, the novel psychoactive bill 2017, which Theresa May signed, which basically criminalized all psychoactive compounds apart from, was it chocolate, caffeine, alcohol and tobacco 
So is that the same yeah. thing that, that happened with Spice then? Because isn't that what... With, isn't with that Spice, the... Sp- Spice, the first, uh, what was it, A-M, some of the letters, like three, uh, three, num- three numbers. Three. That was Pfizer in the 70s, in the fucking 70s. And that was three, actually... Three, that three, was. Three. That yeah, that was Black Mamba, I believe, was the strain of the street name of, of such a such substance. But even then, the amounts that they were sprayed, the concentrations were only five, ten, twenty percent. They were very small doses compared to two, three, four, five hundred percent that you get nowadays with them. And I'd say the proliferation of spice is entirely a consequence of the pharmaceutical industry trying to create patentable compounds. So if they can synthesize and create what you could grow at home, they can still keep you a criminal and lock you up for daring to do it and help others for free. And they can then create a patented compound and make all the money in the world. And it's still then uneducated doctors um, that are not, they don't have a, have a clue. It's, it's, it's your doctor did when you were 15. They go, well, this is what I've been told. Here's the pill. Take the pill. I don't need to ask anything more than that. I've fulfilled my requirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've got 30 minutes with you at the mouse. Crack on. And and, and it's not changed. It, 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 when, I, when I went in to see my neurologist, the first neurologist, he just wanted to put me on lamitrogen. And there was no questions, really. Oh, you've always been epileptic. Go away. Take these. Yeah, but but uh, hold on. But what they're going to do to me? Uh, well, come back and tell me. What? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the common refrain from a doctor, isn't it? Come back if there's a problem. So well, 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 it no, de- it makes me not trust you. It, de- <laughs> look, it makes me not trust you. It's like what the fuck? Seriously, yeah. this is like there's this. Yeah, I, I'm terrible for going to the doctor because I I'll have ten questions in my head about something. And I'd forget nine and a half of them and ask the wrong question. <laughs> I swear, honest to God. <laughs> to flip this over, don't get me wrong. If it hadn't been for, you know, when I had had my grand miles and they put me full diazepam, I could have died. So I, there is a need for pharmaceuticals and I see them as what I call them rescue medication. There is a time and a place for them when it is needed for when certain amounts of healing needs doing, sleep is needed, there is a time and a place. and. It should be available safely, but we need to be given the full picture about them. We need to be told everything about them, not not just sort of, no, be a good person, go away. We need to know more. And there's a lot of knowledge out there, I feel, about cannabis that's being just hidden. And there's a lot of people who've got a lot more experience than half the, well, a lot of the doctors I've spoke to. There, there is some good ones bringing themselves up to date. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I do not want to slag off the NHS and I don't want to call all healthcare professionals. There, uh, there is a time and, a, you know, there is a time and a place for these particular compounds and, and there is a lot of people who do need them. Um, I just always like to bring balance to all, you know, arguments and, and I do, do understand that people, some people do need that, but it's about pro-choice for me. I can't say that enough. Pro choice. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, Slight sidebar, but relating to this. So I watched Patch Adams again the other day. Um, There's a scene where Robin Williams uh, first meets Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, And Philip Seymour Hoffman's come from a long line of doctors and is very prestige and, you know, wants to to do this properly. And obviously Patch is uh, just a dude that's like, went into a mental institution, wanted to, to help people and thought, okay, if I get this qualification, I can go and I can do this. And I, I wonder how much in a percentage wise of the current industry is made up of Philip Seymour Hoffman's and the Robin Williams is denied because of our appearance or because of our class or our culture, because we're, we're a bit crass or a bit rude. Do you know what I mean? But our experience, especially our lived experience, is what is missed most in this. Uh, this whole thing of, I feel in some ways, the weaponization of medical cannabis as a term and as a, an industry, it's been... Uh, somewhat Trojan horsed into our into our community because we were promised at the start by certain campaigns that I'm not going to name or cause any yeah. things with that we were going to be given home grow that they were going to fight in the chambers of parliament to protect home grow that they were going to protect raw cannabis. Now the remnants of such industries are only advocating for these CBMPs. So I'm I, I, I'm quite interested to get your thoughts on what you think other people that don't have the, the letters after their name could potentially do to get some form of, um, not recognition, what's the word? Well, yeah, I suppose in some ways for others to actually hear them, to be seen and to be recognized on that plateau and on that level with these other people, because they may have the skill set, but I feel they're missing the compassion. They're missing the, the, the love that we have for this plant and for the culture that we've grown <laughs> up with in it. It's, it's a bit of a compromise and we've got to be somewhere in the middle, I feel. There's got to be... 
I've played the game for many years and gone, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, put the suit on, you know, tidied myself up, not worn what I'd normally wear. And it has got me through places. Uh, and I think they also then have to meet in the middle of understanding that, you know, they've got to learn and learn from all these people with this knowledge. Um, I'm hoping that I can be that kind of bridge between the two, where the, I, I come from a very poor background. I come from my dad, as I say, he sold and grew cannabis in order for us to survive when I was younger. Um, I was on free dinner. So I come from that background and I've seen it and grown up around it constantly. But it, it, it's there's got to be a start of qualifications being made out there. There's, uh, there's nothing available in this country. And what I can advise to anybody who wants to get into this industry, get some kind of agricultural experience, get some kind of agricultural qualification, get them behind you. It's amazing what some letters can do so people will listen to you. Um, that they, they do treat you differently, as wrong as that may be, is something that I have learned. I mean, something I often joke about is that, you know, okay, the hydroponic industry might have been full of criminals, but at least they were honest criminals. A lot of these that I actually have gone into it, it within this medical or cannabis arena, and it's not all of them. Again, there is a lot of good people within that area, a hell of a lot of good people. But there are some sharks there. There are some who have got no idea, want to make a quick book. And it's what worries me a little bit about the, the up-and-coming psychedelic side as well, because I think they're going to look straight to that of this is the next quick book, this is the next green mush. And it does worry me that, you know, mushrooms are going to be taken over and they're my favourite thing mushrooms <laughs> in the world. Well, that's that, already started, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, if you look at what's sort of gone down in, in Oregon, uh, Oregon, Oregon, sorry, Oregon, <laughs> um, we, they've decriminalised all drugs, but they also legalised psychedelic therapy using psilocybin. But interestingly enough, they said that you didn't have to have an accredited qualification. So this is going to be interesting. It means that I there's two years, I believe I read in the report, that they've got two years to set up the infrastructure for it. By that point, anybody can basically do what the hell they want because they haven't put in this regulatory system. Um, yeah, I'm very nervous of the medicinalization of psychedelics in this country. For all, we're actually now pretty much quite a world leader if you look at some of the stuff that say, Ben Sesser and that is doing um, down in, in Bristol. You know, we're using uh, LSD around alcoholism. Uh, we're starting to use sort of psilocybin and we're starting to use mixed compounds. So they're looking at LSD and MDMA together um, in sitted settings. And obviously we're still adhering to a sort of leery spoke of set and setting. I still feel that the clinical nature of it, it's almost like the um, the two slit experiment in quantum physics. You know I mean? I feel the more we observe this, the less we can kind of get that revelatory experience. I mean, mushrooms grow every fucking where and every year they just go, it's time to eat us. And they appear every goddamn where. And some people who are capitalist minded will go and pick kilos and sell them on. But regardless, people will still have that opportunity to, to imbibe in these substances and to have that potential for a revelatory personal experience so they can have that awakening within themselves to, to want to be better, do better and live better. And I again worry that they would then use medical psychedelics to firm up the law to further push us out of the way. And this is what I'm scared of with, with again, like I said, with cannabis, because if you look at what medical cannabis is under the letter of the law, it's not raw cannabis. So we, all these clinics prescribing it under the letter of the law, that's still schedule one cannabis. They've just got a, a per permission. Uh, uh, we'll look the other way from the home office. I think it's, it's removing fear factor. I think it's a, the big thing of having that prescription is a fear factor removal, yeah. and it's a means of them being able to control it. I, well, I mean, it's quite interesting to see if you see what's happening down in New Zealand, that um, there is no one company, no one cannabis company is allowed to have more than 20% of the market. So you can't have a dispensary there. You can't uh, cultivate. If you're cultivating, you're a cultivator. If you're extraction, you're an extractor. If you you're can't vertically uh, integrate yeah, yeah. The, and which I think is fabulous in the fact that they're thinking more about it, that everybody can have a slice of the pie. And this is what needs to happen because there's, a, there's an up and coming industry there that could, you know, really help put people, you know, into work again. But I think it's going to get raped. And I, I worry about the automation as well. You know, oh, there's a lot of, I don't, yeah. have you ever been to Green Tech in Amsterdam? It's a, it's a horticultural fair and there's always robots there. And this whole greenhouses can operate without one personnel yeah. in there at all. Yeah. And that worries me as well, that we're going to wipe out a whole set of jobs 
Because yeah, of... I mean, so when, when you said, like, in, in New Zealand, imagine that model, that split model and protected model across local communities. Do you know what I mean? And for, for that to be fed into local communities. Sure, then, yeah. the, like, uh, the dispersion of wealth probably wouldn't be a pr- so much of a problem then, would it? Do you know that kind of way? Everybody would be reinforced. Yeah, well, something that is still... I feel ultimately missed by every market. I mean, New Zealand marginally voted down um, yeah. legal legalization this year. Surprising. Uh, yeah, I mean, big up them. They voted uh, euthanasia, which again, that's progressive, all for them. Good on you. It's still kind of weird that you'll allow somebody to end their life, but you won't allow someone to make it better while they're alive. But that's neither <laughs> here nor there. But ultimately, the, these systems, I feel all of them have missed the fact that there are people sat right now in a prison cell for doing what people are now on the covers of fucking magazines for. Yeah. There is still, I'm right. I sent out a freedom of information request to every police force last week. I accidentally sent it to uh, the nuclear, there's a nuclear police, the central uh, nuclear police in this country, didn't know that. Sent it to transport police by accident, sent it to the port <laughs> authorities. Cause I just got a list. I, somebody sent me a list of all, and it went off to everybody. They are being so difficult and making it so, they're throwing section 14 at me saying that I'm uh, being Oh, I can't remember. There's a wonderful word that they've described it as, uh, and basically, it just means that I'm being burdensome. I'm causing them a nuisance You're because I'm because them. yeah, because I'm requesting the figures from each force yeah. during lockdown for yeah. for active raids, yeah. arrests, and then I'm I'm trying to uh, put in freedom of information requests for the uh, CPS to get outcomes because all of the forces are having this nice sort of oh no, we were backing off and we la la la, but they're still targeting the people who should be having legitimate jobs. They knocked down a thousand plant raid. That person shouldn't be going to prison. They should be going to an interview room. This crop's rather healthy. What if you don't do this? How much is this? How much do you usually get back from this? Do you know, do you know what I mean? Because as, as Trev points out wonderfully, this industry is taxed every fucking year. The government treats it like car insurance payments. So they go, people are going to break the law and they're going to pay a tax. So we'll work out a margin for that. And we, put it through the cost into the bill. So if this industry is, is taxed, if we pay tax on all of the newts and the feeds, because let's, let's be realistic, a huge chunk of the hydroponic industry in this country is purely cannabis. Um, but, but, well, I couldn't comment on that, sir. <laughs> well, <laughs> for, for, from, from my own market really? research. <laughs> right, oh, right. Sorry, sorry, I... tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but again, it's it's the hypocrisy of this. This is what burns me up so much. Is I went to the launch of the, what was then at the time the British Hemp Association, and the people I met there, they didn't speak like me. They didn't look like me. Again, for all I, I come across quite articulate. Obviously, at the point I write and I do a podcast. I still live in Durham. I'm still around the some real sort of come perceived as rough people because of the way they speak. So they're real people. Down, yeah, yeah. Whereas I stood in this room and the pretense was palpable. It was physical in the room. You know what I mean? Everyone was there talking about their holdings and how to best protect their family assets. And I'm, I'm like, I just want to keep my friends out of prison. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's the same you said with the prescription. I qualify for a prescription on several um, of my diagnoses. Yeah, I'm not going to touch that with a barge pole because I know I can defend myself if they come through my front door. I don't want the protection of the piece of paper. I want the opportunity to go to court to test this, to tell them the wrong, to, to do exactly as you've said, to speak that truth, because I'd rather be sat in a prison cell having told them the fucking truth than have to play these backhanded games and help prop up a system that is profiting from a uh, prohibition. I couldn't agree more, though. And I, I've had that epiphany in the last two or three years of going in in it all and, and and going in with a perception of this this is this is going to be brilliant i'm i'm working my life dream here and and it's all this country's got it wrong really wrong and i i can't see it being well we all know who's the person who's monopolizing and controlling this and we're not going to mention names um but we know who he is and i'm Hello. seeing things happening in the hydro industry, there's problems coming up, and I, which I suspect he's to do with. Is the hydro industry unionised? Mm, it's a funny industry. It's, it's, it's tried to before, and it's, it's full of kind of people who don't want to. There's some who want yeah. to, some who want to. I think people just want to get on with their little thing. They just want to... But I so, worry that their little thing isn't going to be there much longer because you speak of, he, let's say, he, he shall not be named. Ultimately, he's only a, a puppet of a much larger chain that when you go back, it's it's part of an international investment firm who have a couple of trillion in their pocket. Mm. So, I, again, I worry about, say, 
shout out Hydro Pro down the road in Washington. You know, I mean, support, sponsored and supported uh, Durham City Cannabis Club and a lot of the work that I've done for many years. And I worry for his future genuinely, because then if these huge conglomerates can come in, look at what's happening in Canada. You've got like uh, the Canadian home base, as it were, and B&Q going, why can't we sell cannabis plants? Why can't we sell the hydro equipment? And with their margins and their network, they will literally just, just take away the hydro shops. And it's not about access to equipment. It's about access to expertise, community, and culture. To go in, and most of the hydro shops have that little room where you can go sit and you can make yourself a coffee and have a chat with anyone. You can talk anything and everybody will be accepting of every word that comes out of your goddamn mouth. Yeah. If we, if we lose that, we'll not get it back. It'll just become soulless, faceless, just statistics on the side of a box and no one having a clue, just some clerk there going, well, I don't know. It sells a lot. Mate, it ain't going to go away, that, is it? We're never no. going to let that go away. No. People like ourselves are never going to let... They, they can try and destroy it, but we'll start it up again somewhere else. Yeah. Um, what, and somehow... What will probably, we'll probably happen with, it will be that you will still have quite a handful of these shops and you will get the expertise there. Just like whatever, you know, a hardware store or whatever, do you know that kind of way? It's a small store that you want to go to because they know their shit. Whereas, you know, you go to go into B&Q you, and you ask somebody something, they're just there to do their job. Exactly the same thing is, 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 ap is, is applicable, right? So you'll, you, there'll be a diminished is, is probably the word that we, probably, that we want to look for. But it won't ever go away, no. I don't think so. I, I, want, I want to throw another one in there, though, because, as I say, over, over the years, I've seen the comings and goings and the, the, the human trafficking. I've seen that go occur yeah. through yeah, the yeah. shops. Particularly when I started, it was the Vietnamese. We saw that come through. Um, we're now seeing it with Eastern European. Um, as I said, I'm not in the hydro shop, so I don't see it as much. But we're also starting to see a Russian culture coming through as well. So the shop's setting up. And, I mean, there is a dark side to the hydro industry. I'm not going to lie. There is a very dark side to it. And there's, there's some very dark people going to these shops. And I've dealt with very dark people. Um, so in some ways, I'm hoping it will clean some of that up. Sorry about that, folks. A little bit of technical difficulties. Um, right, so let's move on to the next question then. Yeah, ignore Mac as fuck up there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so next question, I suppose. We've, we've kind of touched on this a little bit as we've gone. Um, it's a classic debate. Again, I don't think either term is correct, but it's a nice headline for this topic, I suppose. And that's decriminalization versus legalization. Where where does do you hang your cap? Oh, well, I'm straight for decriminalization. I don't want to be a criminal anymore. I don't I don't I don't want to feel like a criminal for it. So for me, decriminalization is number one. Legalization. Hmm, the wrong people, I think, will make the money out of it. And we'll then just see a load of shit utter crap that, that is mass produced, that the connoisseur market will disappear. If people want that, it should be available to them. Um, Legalisation could bring, you know, as I say, a lot of jobs, but usually the people who will set up these jobs will profit from it. It won't be the little boutique places that will make the money, unfortunately. So I am, for me at the moment, it's just decriminalization. I don't want to feel like a bad person anymore. And here, here. It, 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 that, that's where I'm at at the moment. I don't think legalization in this country is going to work the way that it should. That's me. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've often obviously written quite a few articles on this in the past and spoken various places about it. And I use the language of re-legalize because ultimately we're not fighting to legalize something that has always been illegal and always been taboo and bad. For the entirety of human history, it was free to us and ubiquitously used throughout a lot of industries. I mean, the diverse industrial properties of cannabis are, are beginning to once again become very well known. Um, but it worries me around where we look at decriminalization in the rest of the world. So places like Portugal, that decriminalized, again, possession. So Oregon have done the same. They've decriminalized possession. The so-called black market or illegal market will still control production and supply and distribution. So there will still be gang violence. There will still be turf wars. There will still be, in this country, county lines, which is entirely a consequence of them going harder and harder for generations after older and older um, people that then just went, fuck it, I'm going to make the money and pay some kid to take the brunt. You know, so 
decriminalization for me, unless we can have some form of regulated supply, still leaves us a victim. Yeah, the end user isn't going to prison anymore, but we could still end up sniffing rat poison instead of cocaine. We could still end up, you know, taking PMA instead of uh, MDMA and dying. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that could fuck up there. But then the legalized side of it is in commercial markets. If, if we then try to make drugs for profit, all we're going to end up with is a lot of people taking a lot of fucking drugs that they shouldn't be taking because we'll sell it to them in the same way we do alcohol. So there'll be these glitzy, glancy uh, videos of girls and Dan, just Dan Bilzerian of drugs. Can you just imagine that? The, <laughs> can you imagine that? that? That's the kind of shit that I worry about. And I think a lot of people fear for legalization. Yeah. But again, I fear that decriminalization is a placation that goes far too short so that yes, it'll yeah. disempower a lot of users, but then yeah, who's been growing and selling you that weed for 40 years, Mike? It's Dave down the road. You know what I mean? Why has he done it? to support his kids, you know what I mean? To, to keep clothes on the back, to keep food food in their bellies. And you're going, I'm all right, Jack, I've got, I'm fine. I can do what I want. But when you selling it to me, it's you that's going to get in trouble. It's mm. the same thing I feel with the prescription thing. It's again, it's it's placation. It, one by one, it takes us all the way until there's nothing left. They've already removed medical from the cannabis argument because anybody that wants to be a good person and not one of these dirty druggy stoners, is going to go down the prescription route because they, they don't want to be associated with the lower class. They don't want to be associated with the, the detrimental and negative image that has been perpetrated and created as propaganda for prohibition. You know what I mean? Yes, there are cultural divides, but that is entirely through policing. Do you know what I mean? If, if this, this community was given the same opportunities that, that, that we were in the South, there would not be half of the problems that we have up here. The strength that people have for each other, they don't rob their own, they don't harm their own. But these, these people have got to, got to eat, they've got to live, they've got to work, you know what I mean? So we still end up with, with, with dealers versus dealers, with communities versus communities. Whereas they should actually be given an opportunity to go legit. We're talking about ubiquitous cannabis testing. We need ubiquitous drug testing. Most of the fucking universities have the spectrometer machines that can test all of these substances, but not the willing to allow people to come and do it. We obviously had the loop as a big movement for a while at festivals yeah. and uh, all power, power to Fiona and the team and everyone that worked on that project because yeah. fuck that saved lives that actively saved lives. I took several samples of things to, to Boomtown, some of which that I'd procured elsewhere, some of that I'd procured there. And that avoided me taking something that, that would have been something I wouldn't have wanted to take. So fentanyl is a big thing at the moment. Yeah, fuck yeah. me. I've seen the overdose in comparison to heroin in the two vials, and you're like, is there something in this one? I can't even... I, yeah. I'll see if well, I can find that picture with each other. The, 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 the labs in China have been pressured uh, by the Americans. Remember the Americans pressuring the UN to create um, the... Sing Man convention which led to the whole war on fucking drugs and um, they're now pressuring china to stop producing fentanyl so fent uh, china are now producing car fentanyl which i believe is 20 times stronger really? than fentanyl. so fentanyl is fentanyl's 100 times stronger than a standard opioid yep. and then yeah i think car fentanyl is 20 times stronger it's, a, it's an elephant tranquilizer if i'm not mistaken um, but again that's been found in cocaine it's been found in like mm. upp uppers recreational upper drugs which is is quite a fucking scary thing in terms of what it can actually do to your heart and what mm. it can do to you when you have if you say an experienced let's call it raving sessioner whatever your terminology is in your region people that go out and live for that that community session you know what i mean a lot of us did in our youth some of us still do in our mid middle age shall we call it um <laughs> you know uh, it's again i see nothing wrong with that the, the people that i have met again you want to talk about sort of amazing weirdos jesus christ go to a music festival uh, go to free parties, you know what I mean? Go to squat parties, go meet yeah. some real people in this world and it will change your perception around this. It, 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 just, it just will. I mean, one of the things that is, sorry, just pontificate on this a sec, but one of the things that really bothers me is within our industry is this snobbery towards other drugs. So I, I will hear people that are advocating for legalization of cannabis and like, we should all be allowed to grow it going, oh, smackhead, crackhead. And you're like, whoa. Pro-choice, mate. You know, it's up to you. If you want to, as long as it's, it's harm reduction as well, and I'm glad you brought the loop up because, you know, that, uh, that initiative is so amazing. Um, you know, the, the fact that people can get it tested what they're wanting. For me, you know, if I grew up around a lot of smackheads, I grew up a lot around different kind of people who took different drugs, you know, it was quite normal within my household that to, to actually happen. And they're not bad people. They're very misunderstood. And generally, they just want to escape from something. There's some kind of trauma happened in their life that they just want to escape from. And what's wrong with that? Nothing. Um, exactly. Exactly. To deny a thirsty man water 
is criminal. And that is effectively as this is. I mean, if you look at um, Gabor Mate's work in sort of Toronto, right, when he worked with intravenous users for what, 15, 20 odd years, and he said that time after time, the people that they, even when they stabilize them, so they remove heroin or they get them on sort of methadone or try and work a work down system, which again, I think is abhorrent. Um, they stabilize their housing, try to set them up with work and whatever else, and they still continue to use street heroin. And then it just, they just start, slowly start to change the questions and the focus and figure out that actually, if you look at it as it's medicine, they need a me- they, they've identified this thing. When they take it, it does for them psychologically and physiologically exactly what they need to get them through that moment. Yeah. I mean, we, we the British, we did the, Brit- uh, the British way up until I think it was 76. So I think we, we really held out past the 71, oh, no, 73. So we held out past the Misuse of Drugs Act and still prescribed heroin. There's still, I believe, people get, getting prescription diamorphine in the UK today as part of this scheme. There's only a handful of them. But there was a famous case of a woman who raised two children. Um, she uh, paid off a mortgage for a house and everything. And she used heroin every day. But again, because she had the support and the understanding and no one was going, you need to stop this. You know, you've got to stay, but anybody on any addiction, you have to allow them to stabilize at a point, figure out the triggers and the things that are uh, aggravating that trauma, then give them a safe space to explore the trauma yeah. and then help them after the trauma build that fucking life. Yeah. If yeah. we had that compassionate, uh, compartmentalized approach to this yeah. in this country, rather than going, <laughs> when you stop your drug, we'll help you. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's backward. It is backward, but it's effort. It's effort. And we are lazy pricks. That is the end of it. No, no, seriously, right? Because here's the thing. You were list- you listed out what, five, six steps there. P- people switch off because yeah. they're, 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 they feel the same sort of you know, environmental pressures constantly from broken systems from every fucking angle. That, that is, that's the easiest thing to do. Do you know what I mean? When you're tired and you, you don't want to hear it. You don't fucking want to hear it. Do you know what I kind of mean? And with that, we need to fucking change that too. Um, and like for us to be healthy and uh, and alert and driven constantly 24 hours a, uh, a day you know every day of the fucking year when you're fighting a broken system on every fucking level just to fucking survive do you know what I mean it's it's a hard task for an awful lot of people and I don't I don't I don't um, I don't blame them do you know that kind of way it's understandable is what I'm trying to say it's not just understandable. I mean, if you look at it like this, I once, shout out to my mother, <laughs> uh, I once had a, a conversation with my mother uh, about coffee. She can't get out of bed without one of those giant ass mugs with two tablespoons of black co- uh, coffee black. She needs that. So then we had a conversation. Like, All right, hypothetically, you live in a world where f- caffeine's being criminalized. So you can't buy it in the supermarkets. There's no more coffee shops. Would you score it? Would you ring a guy? Would you go and you meet him? Would you break the law? Would you actively go and, and running through the sort of things? And then I got on my phone and we ran through um, sort of the consequences, you know, the headaches you get around day two, day three of caffeine withdrawal, talking all the stuff. And she was like, well, yeah, yeah. And I think it is that perception that if we criminalized all of the things that are legal now, if it was switched and tobacco, chocolate, sugar, you know, some of the things that the, the legal escapisms that we use were criminalized, far more of us would be criminals. Because it's not about dissuading them through a criminal punitive system. It's about what fucking works. And you can indoctrinate as all yeah. you want in a, being a good person and law-abiding paradigm and shit. But ultimately, if I find some of the works in my soul, all I then do is hide it from you. If you're then telling me I'll get arrested for the thing that helps me, I'm not going to fucking tell you about it. Do you know what I mean? It's that simple. So then people follow that mental trajectory that then they end up having to hide from everybody, yeah. feeling ashamed at every turn. Yeah, man. So then they, they get more and more bitter with the system. Do you know what I mean? So, so this is why, again, I, I managed to, I'm not going to name the individual, but I had an in-depth conversation with somebody not that long ago about how I personally interact with homeless people. And it's humanity. It doesn't matter if you ain't got shit to fucking give them. Just acknowledge them. Yeah, man. Do you know what I mean? If you've got a bit of time, sit with them. I mean, I went to, again, shout out with the Vox in Brighton one night, went, had a few pills, and it, I don't know what the compound was, but I was far more loved than dance. So I went out and all the money I had for, for drinks, I went and just stopped at a homeless person outside every pizza shop. What do you want? Boom, here, have a chat. And was just just happy and just, just to have somebody that would acknowledge me on that level and accept me for being high at that point, for being who I was and what I wanted at that time, which was a genuine human connection. And then explaining that to another person, they've then gone out and sought to do the same. And I think, again, it's just, 
it's this kind of thing. It's creating content and, and having conversations to show where there's, there's other ways to deal with this. They're not just a uh, dirty homeless, uh, smack it or uh, whatever. It's a human fucking being. You know what I mean? They haven't just chosen to sit there and be in that situation. They've been forced down that route and at every turn they've been denied the help that they need. And I think the one thing that we can do with the, the, the legal kind of a system is fucking use some of this profit that's going towards all of these hedge funds to help these individuals. Absolutely. Because if we had cannabis assisted or cannabis um, substitution, so you could literally go into a center and go, well, I'm using this at the minute. Okay, well, we reckon if we give you 400 milligrams of THC a day and this and this and this, this will help you do that. Come back to us each day, show that you're making the progress and we'll give you it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those kind of exchange programs, because it's not even the drug that would help them there. It's you wanting to help them it's them actually seeing a trusted human being someone yes. that's what we're missing this is what the cannabis component is like the entourage effect of legalization it has sort if, of, if we don't have the culture yeah you're not going to have the benefits yeah Do you it, know what i mean yeah it, it's it's contextual on an individual basis as well i mean mm -hmm. that gives you some sort of level of validation doesn't it sort of not in, in sort of a pride pride sense but more sort of just a warm fuzzy feeling Do you know that kind of way as opposed to this constantly mentally oscillating almost becoming uh, a parody of sorry yeah coming becoming the paradigm that, that that people are so willing to fucking judge you by do you know that kind of way you become that after a while it eats away at you do you know that kind of way and i'll be honest with you i still have i still have um um <clears throat> days where i can't hand, I, I can't handle the idea of being a criminal like I, the anxiety, the anxiety level that goes through the fucking roof, right? And I, I can, I can, I consider myself quite logical in the way that I think, uh, you know, that kind of way. So, and it, it's almost worse because I'm constantly oscillating and constantly picking things apart and just and literally going boy, 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 like this all the fucking time. And and it's you know, I can, I can track it down to certain certain elements. I know what it is, and it's fucking prohibition one hundred percent of the time. And it is it 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 brings me completely out of uh, you know i'm not myself i'm a quaking fucking mess at, at that at that point and do you know what i mean you you somebody might look at me and go oh, jesus he's you know he's oh he's stressed out or whatever he's having a fucking bad day but if you fucking know me man i'm never like that ever ever but when when certain certain things happen around prohibition or whatever occasionally and i'm good with it nowadays because i've managed it but occasionally i can't manage it and it's just I'm back at that level. I'm back doing this blah, 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 and kind of kind of a thing, and I can't get fucking out of it. You know, it. And I don't wish it on anybody. It sounds, it sounds like nothing compared to like cancer or you know some sort of, uh, you know, proper terminal illness. I'm not saying proper, but you get what I'm trying to try and try to picture. Is proper, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I, I'm not trying to like have, uh, have one sort of trump the other. But I'm just saying it's like, especially around men especially around men, if I can be stereotypical for a second, we don't talk about mental health or we haven't done. We were, we're much better at it nowadays than we were, say, when I was growing up or whatever. But, I mean, that's a, that's a really tricky cocktail, especially if I wasn't able to control that. And that was constant in my life every fucking day of the week. You can imagine how I would um, react to my immediate... Um, fucking surroundings my locality how i would envision my attitude towards politics towards tolerating people towards being empathic you know that kind of way it's fucking madness and it all comes down to a choice a fucking choice ah but you're making the wrong one maka it's your fault you shouldn't no the law's the law yeah. and no, you should no, no, just no. stop law's you should law. just stop don't do it then don't do it but fuck you get some context <laughs> <laughs> educate yourself Sorry. Can I ask a pair of you a question? Are yeah. either your parents? No. No. Because when you become a parent, it stops being about you. And it starts being about that life you've created and how that it affects oh. them. And, the, and and that that is when I went into real, I can't talk about this. Yeah. And and that yeah, that yeah, that yeah. Zzz, and that is when it really and as I say, my son turning 16 in this year has completely changed it. That's why I'm on this podcast at the moment, because it's now time to talk out about it. Mm -hmm. And that responsibility is not, I'm still responsible for him, but that's kind of, that is what, what that made me have bigger fear and want to hide and not talk about things. And there's still things I won't talk about, about things yeah. I've done, 
because I still don't. Yeah, feel... that's fair enough. That's fair enough. That's, that's for future future podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm I'm getting there. We're talking about that. Um, it, it, it's but it is when it become, when you get when you have children, it stops being about you. It's it's strange how it does instantly. Mm-hmm. You know you. you but it sounds worse, so, to be yeah, honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> it not, not only sounds worse, it's it's then that's two lives that are damaged by exactly. prohibition. Because you think of the moments when you'll have had to explain, I imagine, in his youth about drugs or certain things, and you'll have had to say the, the, the things that we're told to say. Not what you believe, but the things that you think that you need to keep him safe. You couldn't do what your parents did for you and say, no, we just there's some things that are private and there are some things that are public. You know what I mean? Because even yeah. that 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 taught you, even though it kept you kind of under the, the the thumb in a certain way with that kind of mindset, it still taught you enough to protect yourself that allowed you to get to where you are with the beliefs that you had. So now you're at the perfect opportunity with the professional prowess and the, the reputation and the career that you've built to, to, to exactly that, to speak your truth and to have the opportunity to to kind of negate any of the, the potential, what's the word, like... Um, bitterness that might be in you caused by that because i i feel angry i'm angry and bitter every day because i've only been doing this four odd years i've been evangelicalizing all my goddamn life about drugs i've been using them most of my life but it was only until i actually concentrated it into something and tried to actually direct it that it started to 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 really feel that I, I'd live that life for a reason. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I, f- I feel the same is very much true if, with you. Yeah, completely. And that and, and watching you stand up and start shouting and ranting gave me the balls to go, come on, Carly, stop being stop being pathetic and set in the shadows. I remember watching you once and said, we shouldn't hide in the shadows. And you was going off on one of your rants. <laughs> that you do. And then, but it gets me G'd up and I'm like, yes! I have to chat about yeah. this! And, and then, then my husband tells me to shut yeah. up. Yeah. That's Quite exactly the response I want, though. That's exactly why I've done this. And sometimes, honestly, that that it's kind of over the hair on my arm go a little bit, because honestly, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I do this. Because sometimes cool. it does feel lonely when I'm just sat there with a couple of cameras and I'm just fucking going at it. It feels cathartic and good for me, but at the same time as I'm worried that I'm either turning people off with too much passion as it were, but then at the same time, I'm aware that I'm igniting the people that that have that passion still, that, that have kept that flame dormant inside, but still protected it. Because I feel that within us all, it, it's it's no one person, no one organization, need, not even one fight that's gonna push us across this line. It's an acceptance within ourselves that we can and should fucking do better. Yes. yes. Absolutely. And we should be ourselves, not yeah. not yeah. pretend to be something we're not. We should be ourselves. 100%. And I think, uh, I mean, how old are you now? You must be sort of the same age as me. I'm trying to think about it. 32. No, I'm yeah, you, how are you years. younger than me? How? <laughs> <laughs> I had you at my age. Shit, you're old generation below me. So you you didn't actually do the original rave scene then. No, I, I got I got second wave, but it meant that I I parted with a lot of first generation, so I, I got the best of it. So I didn't get the a lot of the ugliness of the first generation. You know what I mean? Because they they'd figured out their shit. So by the time yeah. we got, got the travel and free parties, that we got it down. Everyone knew what to do. Yeah, yeah it came with traveling dealers. Everybody yeah. knew supply. Every everything was community. You you couldn't talk to somebody without them knowing everybody else. It was just a wonderful experience for for a lot of my youth. Yeah, and I feel. Uh, yeah. Nothing like those free parties, yeah. nothing ever. And the fact that we didn't have smartphones, that it was a phone number that you had to just keep ringing yeah. and keep ringing and keep ringing <laughs> and, and you'd miss the turn in and the fox and hound, we've just gone past the fox and hound, go back, turn around <laughs> and, and that kind of side of things. And I am so glad my, I'm, I'm glad I'm not, I feel sorry for my son because he's not going to get to experience that because the phone is glued to it and as much as you try, but if you cut that off, you're cutting off his means of communication with his friends. Mm. You are essentially cutting a social life away as much as you try and say you're not going to be that parent who does that. It You end up giving in to it because they're, they're not then part of that WhatsApp group that where everything's happening yeah. so they don't get invited to the party kind of yeah. thing. And but they don't seem to have parties in the same way. They don't seem to do the same kind of things when I was like that age of the the silly. Well, I think it's the the same thing that we kind of live under with um, with with prohibition. Really, it's the perception of being observed, 
And I think because of smartphones, so it alters our behavior. There was a, an idea in was it the 17th century of a prison with one guard and you build a tower in the middle with one observation deck and 360, you put the cells. And the idea was is psychologically that none of the prisoners could know when they were being observed. So it would modify their behavior 100% of the time. If you then look at what's happened to humans in especially this fucking country, because we're one of the most surveilled countries on the planet, the the change of our behavior. So in public, we're all, oh, this is my professional persona. And then behind the scenes, we're all right. Yeah, and it's all it's all bollocks. So we so we, we create these personas and these things for ourselves. And I think that unfortunately your son's generation, especially my my nephew's generation, I mean they're what 13 and 10, and they've had Facebook and everything, they've been online for time. You know, what I mean they've followed me for a long time. And I it's they look at my stuff and I can't then when I'm there with my sister, have that conversation with them. I'm like, you do know they look at my crap. They read this. They're aware of this. Yet you won't allow me to have this conversation. So I think that there is still the, the, these all these taboos and all of this, this stuff around that. Yeah. Because if they're then reading it and taking it in as the language that I'm using, if I can't then soften it to them and allow them to, to understand it in their way, they're going to take that in the wrong way. And that could harm an entire generation. No, that's I true. Can't, yeah. You know what I mean? So that I am very true. aware yeah. of what, what I say and how I do. I've, I've modified myself in the past few years quite a bit as the, uh, my nephews and nieces are getting older, because I am very aware yeah. that anybody can watch this. Anybody can read any of the content and anything that I've put out there. And obviously I, I'm an adult, so I, and I don't have children, so I don't think about it. But actually you've, you've really planted something in my head there in the sense that yeah, it's, it's worse in that sense, because even I, it's even my sister who now basically agrees with what I do. She can't do that. She's a, she's, she's a teacher, you know, and she's in a position that she can't, so because of her profession, she's not allowed an opinion. Yeah, you know, you know I mean? her mum's in the same position. She's a dinner lady and lollipop lady, and <sighs> and exactly the same. Of I don't, but, I love my mum to death, but yeah. I don't mention her much because I don't want yeah. to get in trouble. But, but I mean, this this sort of level of 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 like guilty by association is that really needs to go quick. You know, it yeah. really does kind of just because you you are related to somebody that uses cannabis that you're studied too. What are we five? It's fucking ridiculous. Uh, do you know what I mean? It sounds like something that, that happened when we when we were in school back in the day. But I, sorry, you ha just to just to change tack there a second. You have me well intrigued now about what this Generation Z are doing at parties and stuff. And I, I don't want you to go into any details or nothing. But it's a case of I'm I'm wondering, is it is it so different because we're so spread? across these different platforms and just to build on what you were saying simple and sort of combine the two together is like if you're if you're on twitter and instagram and facebook and whatnot you're i find that people's personas are different on across these platforms you know you, you're 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 to well, there's a lad that i listened to in ireland um blind boy and he he said something similar where he was like you're your ideal self on in instagram it's bullshit it's, it's complete nonsense and then you're trying to be your smartest self on, 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 on Twitter. And that's sort of bullshit as well. Do you know that kind of way? So I'm wondering, is it because there's TikTok now and does, you, you have to do funny videos and whatnot that is so has social media ruined the sort of rebellious um, fucking kids parties? Is that what it is? Right. These students up there being locked on lockdown. If I'd have been locked... In, in, I mean, I went to uni in uh, 1999. If that had been me locked in at a halls of residence, I'd have been pulling the, I'd have been creating riots within two nights. <laughs> two yeah. nights, I'd have been pulling fences down. I, and I was like, ah, they need to grow some balls. These are students. <laughs> what the hell is happening to them? Come on, raise up and get some genitalia. Yeah. yeah. I, th I, th I think it's the, um, the, the, the permanence of consequence. So I am very lucky in the fact that I was a generation that was on MySpace and most of my peers forgot our passwords. So all of our lovely high angle shots were on there. Obviously, luckily as Murdoch bought the, the empire, there was a crash and they basically purged the original pages. So a lot of that disappeared. But now you're seeing politicians being fired and musicians being harassed for tweets from fucking 10 years ago and that. Yeah. So I, I then think that these kids are quite attuned to now is everything. They, it's like a, a, a constant presence they're not allowed to forget. So therefore, it's rather than create a social, I mean, look at it, they're, they're taking Xanax like motherfuckers in this country. That is one of the, seriously, the younger really? you are, the more likely you are to take Xanax, right? And they come in bars like this, and honestly, really? if you're a novice, you take an end of a bar, you're on your ass, right? And these, these they get the tolerance up there, and then it becomes a thing of, they, they require it, they need it. 
the, the stress and anxiety I, I can't imagine in the younger generations because of this mechanism. There's they can see the way. If I, if, I, if I say the wrong word now, and then in three years, the culture changes, and my attempt at being funny on Twitter and yeah. being ironic becomes the reason I can't get a job in the trade that I've crafted and earned this debt in yeah. for, for many years. So the, I can imagine feeling like paralysis. That they're just like, so yeah. they wait for social acceptance. So then when they see the crowd do something, they go, oh, I can do it now, I'm yeah, allowed to do yeah. it. And they back it. So I think it's 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 denying them an opportunity to develop a fully rounded personality. It's fractulating their personalities, as you said, across media. I'm a victim to it as well, myself, to the point of, I basically don't post anything on Facebook unless it's to the Simple Life page and it's articles and news and things to create conversations and, and education because you can get lost in the mire of debate in Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So at least. Yeah, and it, it's and so it's all, negative. But it's all this left, left, not left and right, but you know, this you're there yeah. and you're and you're here but, but, but what that's there entirely are... generated by the the fucking uh, algorithm <clears throat> yeah that's it all is. it is, is it's just it's the algorithm just creates further and further diverse appearance of diversity yeah so you end up with people going you know i'd kill you in your sleep why because you disagree with me on homelessness do you know what i mean we've ended up with this these political things because yeah. such things that it's, it's visceral hate and yeah. people are such a to each i other. have seen i have seen pockets of um um, social progression in a sense where people have ad openly admitted something in the past that was, say, racist, for instance. I think the most recent one that I can think of is Liam Neeson. I don't know if you remember this one. And Liam Neeson, I think, and I'm going to summarize and butcher this, okay? So please look this up. Um, but he had a relation or somebody close to him who had been raped, I think, at that time. And it was by uh, a, a black man. And he was going around, like, trying to find and going to kill this guy, right? But he, his language, like, was, you know, inappropriate word this, inappropriate word that, or whatever. And it's a case of, he was telling the story of how out of fucking line he was. And now how, when he thinks back on it, how guilty he feels. And how, how that... Oh, he's he's had to deal with that over years and that's led to him educating himself and getting to a point where he would never do that now even if it was you know a similar situation because of the process that, that he's gone through and you know i mean there was a point in time and just to tie, sort of tie that in it's it, 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 it sort of um that was representative of the time. It doesn't excuse it. Of course, it fucking doesn't. But to vilify a man for his social for his social progression in that regard, um, in that sort of context, isn't a positive thing. It doesn't help anything. Do you know that kind of way? Um, so we we I have seen pockets of people that would be categorically bound, in one way or the other, actually appreciate that and go, "Don't be shitting on this." guy i'm sorry to bring it up Liam Neeson. i'm really sorry if this happens and, and you know it goes viral again or whatever but you just kind of go why would i hate this man and call him a racist now for t him telling a story of how he progressed into this and if we can move like if we can move our mindset more into that into that sort of methodology and then less into this well you did this, this once so fuck you forever then we can move past this and keep sort of, you know, enjoying all of our spread across social media and the whole lot. That was a really long, really long fucking diatribe, but it was relevant this time. I didn't lose my train of thought for once. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was really long and probably not relevant. So let's, do you know what? Let's get back no, on questions. <laughs> no, no, I, I, relevant. I think it's relevant and you raise a good point. Again, as you said to me in episode 0.5, guys, you can check out all previous episodes now on Spotify. <laughs> um, just a little shameless plug there, sorry. Um, but yeah, in, in episode 0.5, you said to me that we should include sort of anything can allow all topics to sort of be relevant. And I, I think that that is a good point because alluding back to the previous point I was talking about, about the social paralysis of the younger generations is exactly then that mechanism. If they then fear a fuck up and they then see there's potential consequences of even admitting a fuck up, you're not, you're yeah. not going to do it. And I think yeah. the polarization that you're seeing on Facebook is a part of the algorithm. And I think we've got this tribalism of left versus right. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not even just left versus right sort of anymore. It's just these warped idea, ideologies that are getting more and more uh, maladaptive and cancerous, really, and they're just consuming themselves. And it's the thing of I 
people have to identify to one or the other. I think. Yeah, it's ultimately, we, you basically told you have to do one of the things and fence it, and, and then for you, you see, you have to sit within in that that spectrum. So I think yeah. I, I, you're seeing again in young people two extremes: environmentally conscious, sort of self anointed woke generation and then and then you and then you see in the traditionalist youth conservative sort of people that are very fascistic in a lot of their worldviews you know what i mean that i mean look at the whole thing with with brexit and everything else a lot of that got very uh, good support amongst the youth part of that i imagine was kind of a tear the system down kind of book but a lot yeah. of it is defensive traditional values or defense of their world because if they're then the algorithm the social media the screen the input that they're taking the world through is being adaptive and changing and showing all of this difference that, and it doesn't represent them they're going to feel attacked they're going to feel alienated and ostracized so then they're going to seek to find other communities where they don't feel that way and then they'll be sucked in there's, yeah. some amazing, there's some amazing videos online about how you can go from what do they call it normie to extremey and it's how you, using the algorithms on youtube and whatnot you can very quickly go from one video mm. into being full-on fascist like murder muslims kind of style yeah. so there's consequences of these systems i mean today zuckerberg and um i can't remember the name for the twitter guy were grilled by uh, the senate on the hearings about sort of what the hell is going on with your technologies and i think that ultimately this generation the past few years they've, they've been brought up into this they were given a smartphone before they could really articulate what it is that they would want to do with one so they're given the power of the world in their hand literally like no generation has before and then they were hypnotized like ma manipulated into these systems of control via apps and via certain websites and then these huge international conglomerates have grown up that are then able to manipulate the very thought processes the, their political opinions you know what band that they can listen to because ultimately if their other friends aren't listening to it i can't listen i can't see listen to that so they'll hide away and they'll do it again in home. So this is why we have this juxtaposition between our public personas on social media and who our friends know us to be. And yeah. you end up seeing it more and more nuanced as the change of algorithms, as Macker alluded to, with people trying to be their funniest self on Twitter, people trying to be their most passionate political pundit yeah, on yeah, Facebook. Yeah. And, and look at my perfect life on Instagram. That's such a... you, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, did you have you have you watched the social dilemma on Netflix? I yeah. haven't, but you have, haven't you? Do. You've well, got do to watch it because uh, uh, I, I think I asked you, Simba. I left a comment when you shared it. It was like, Is this just going to piss me off? And it was like, Yeah, I was like, Yeah, I'm not in the mood for it. <laughs> no, you need when to you can take it, take it. What were you going to say? You oh. need to watch it. Um, afterwards, I had a moment, I was stood in a shop, and I, after that point, caught up all of my loyalty cards. Every single Brilliant. one yeah. went, yeah, 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 Every, yeah. Just I went, You're tracking me, yeah, you're going to send me uh, an email that will be about what I just bought from you and at what time, and it just, I, and, and after watching that, I slowed down on my social media massively. Yeah. I started to think, do I need this? But I still need this as a business tool yeah, yeah, to yeah. communicate. You gotta play the game in, in a sense, you know, that kind of way. So the other, yeah. the other thing is, do you know what the scary bit is? After GDPR, um, you notice that every website changed, no matter if it wasn't like a social account website or if it was, it didn't matter, whatever it was, you logged onto it, you had to, two, was it two pop-ups? One was like in browser notifications and you, everyone just goes block, block, block. You don't even look at it anymore. You see them pop up, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. But what you notice is that they, you have to accept all the advertising cookies or they have it reworded in a way where you reject all and some things are automatically on all the time. And then you can go in and you can, you can either, <clears throat> you can either like, um, deselect all of them which was what what most decent sites do but what you'll find is any dodgy site right what they'll do is they'll require you to individually pick every single one and there's about hundreds of them so it's like what happens in that regard in in that situation when you're in a rush or you're doing it except you still give them the fucking information that they shouldn't have had in the first place you give it to them it's madness i, I just go not looking at your website yeah yeah so i just go off same, same. Yeah. Go, go, Not go, looking go, at your website. Go, go, yeah. go back to DuckDuckGo and, and type in the headline or whatever it was that you were looking for. Yeah. That's it, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, uh, uh, that's what I've started doing. And it, it, that program, you want to need to watch it, it'll scare you. I know. It'll scare the shit I'm out of you. I'm reluctant, though. <laughs> it, it, it'll help you understand. No, I get it. I will do, I will do. I don't know how many how far you've gone down the rabbit hole. I mean, this situation, I don't like calling this COVID whatever's going off right 
I've gone down the rabbit hole. I've got friends who've gone down the rabbit hole. I've tried to throw the rope and can't get them back out of it. Um, and there's some really deep rabbit holes there are. of different there kind are. of directions. <clears throat> yeah, there are. Um, well, this you, helps. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It helps to explain how people go down that rabbit hole and end up in an echo chamber. Yeah. And it helps to it, it, it helps me to then remove myself a lot from stuff and just come away of, right, I'm going to get books out again. Because every time I turn that page, there isn't an advertisement <laughs> popping up on it. Yeah. It's brilliant, they're fantastic, yeah. and you just turn the other page, and it's just yeah. information. Yeah. And and I'm not trying to siphon through. Is this the article still, or am I yeah. in an advertisement? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's caught me out a few times. Well, what's what's just a build on as well is is when you're being lost down these rabbit holes. The worrying thing is that there are organisations ready to accept you with open fucking arms and give you the validation that you so desperately fucking uh, desire and then you're sucked in that's it you're done kind of well, they, they build themselves off these algorithms there are people yeah. that there are, there are people that are fucking smart like we know in the sort of in, it's not in the influencer community for example that a save on instagram will bump your algorithm like more than anything so more people that, so. save, that yeah. save your pictures yeah. will increase the interactivity of your account so a lot a lot of things that we face at the minute i've faced a lot for many years from these organizations is shadow banning so when we used to do the events as dcc when i used to do the monthly ones for that summer by the second month my facebook page had been adapted so my share button didn't have a group option then they removed my page option then they just they started making so i wasn't deliberately blocked i didn't violate any terms and conditions and receive an email or a strike or a warning or anything like that they just started adapting what i could ac actively do yep do, yeah. do you know what i mean and so we're seeing this across other platforms as well where people's accounts sort of they get put on a warning and then suddenly come back or disappear i mean we had the great purge god when was that uh 20 was it 2018 and youtube twitter no, i Facebook, remember that yeah and instagram literally in about a week all went fuck you there were people with million plus subs on youtube million plus accounts on instagram and that just vanished no terms and condition violation warnings no nothing you were just gone your account never existed when i lost my the first durham account after our, we had a obviously the autumn expo shout out the autumn expo wonderful event um the day literally the day after that our instagram uh, instagram account was gone i appealed it to instagram who said that the account didn't exist it never existed that was their response and there was no way to ask that because then i couldn't appeal it i couldn't do anything to it it was just it didn't though it never existed man you dreamed it yeah. it was a salvia-esque thing but there's, <laughs> there's also people that are finding their ips being blocked so your ip address on your phone if you then get targeted through one of the apps to have removed because you're you're not it's not a case of violating their terms and conditions you're just you're doing something that's against what they like so you just just the fuck appear and then when you try to download and set up a new account that email address instantly gets blocked. Yeah. And then try to set up another account and that email address is then blocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's some really sinister shit goes on. And these are, some of them are quite mm. small accounts and the, they'll say in the, the back sort of rooms that, oh, it's for privacy and we're to stop drug dealing and whatnot. And then you've got policing institutions and politician, political institutions pushing these organizations to get more and more and more access when they've spent the better part of nearly a decade addicting us to these things to give them every secret we have to, to do the, oh, I want to do the personality test. So which Scooby-Doo character am I? And you're filling 50 fucking questions about your most intimate shit and you don't think nothing of it. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And they, they designed this whole departments. Again, Mike, it's part of some of this is in that uh, social dilemma. But when you, the more you look at it, and again, go down some rabbit holes here, people. Google some of it. or use whatever search engine you use. <laughs> and, 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 and actually look at some of this because it is scary shit. We talk about it censorship is. in China and go, oh my God, with the citizenships go, oh my God, with this and this and this. You're like, dude, they tell you what to think about what I have for breakfast. Yeah. Info they influenced the whole election with it. And they showed how they did it as well. And how the like, but the person who invented the like button and came up with it. And how it then keeps, the, the clever thing about it was it showed you how it started. Have you ever noticed that friends have appeared that you really don't like, that you went to school with and you're like, no, there's a good reason I'm not friends with you. Why am I seeing you? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's almost like they know negative reactions increase interaction the more negative the content the more likely you are to see it so he who shall not be named is currently scrolling through as my recommended friend at the minute um <laughs> so it's it's it, it, it is and it, so i've it, 
disengaged a lot with uh, Facebook, really. I very rarely post it. Obviously, I posted an anniversary picture the other day. But other than that, I post very little uh, personal. It is a professional platform. And it's it's about us. Once you recognize that these tools have these things inbuilt, you have you can inform uh, use them in an informed way. So as long as you can then go, all right, if I set, say, only an hour of time per day on an app, so I'm not mindlessly scrolling, <laughs> you know, um, try to address behaviors of when you typically use your phone. I mean, I've started doing a thing of when I'd normally pull up my phone for that two minute, I'll just have a quick check. I'm just sitting. Don't fuck all. Just try it and just sit just for a minute, just to train that into myself so that when yeah. I have free time or downtime, I'm not trying to fill it with more shit because I've had it before as well. Some nights I'll go when I'm like in a rabbit hole on a night and I'm looking for stuff, I'm writing an article, I'll go to bed and it's still on my head. I'm seeing yeah. websites, yeah, 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 yeah. the shit in it. And my brain's still trying to eat all this information in. Yeah. I'm just like, I just need some peace. So you can imagine that if an average youth nowadays is spending like eight to 10 hours just fucking scrolling. You see it, man. You see it embedded on your eyelids and shit. I've seen it. <laughs> I mean, you laugh, you laugh. I'd be playing, playing the fucking PlayStation. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes I go off on, on one where I'm just like, fuck this, I'm not having anything. So that, they're usually the anxiety days where I just write everything off and I go, I'm sitting down, I'm playing that fucking thing because that's what I want to do and I don't want to think about anything else. And for that, it helps and that's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, talk down about it. But sometimes, man, I look up at the clock and I'm going, six and a half hours is gone. Six and a half hours. And I'm and literally, well, clo- I close my eyes like that. And I can fucking see. I can fucking see the screen. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I don't know. I, uh, how I think the next um, genetic evolution will be just lack of eyelids. Everybody's just going to be like this. There's thumbs. no bl- thumbs. <laughs> I, th- I think we're gonna we're gonna get these lumps on thumbs, scrolling lumps. An extra knuckle. Mm. That kind of thing. I, I mean, I, I've been talking with women in weed, and we're going to start doing a book club. So getting people mm. back into books again, bringing out the books that we've got, talking about them and encourage, because I found on a night now, nine o'clock, screens are off, books. If you want to read, you want some information, paper. Look at that. Don't want a Kindle, don't want anything like that. Get that paper book out and read it. Yeah. And and I am, th- th- we're going to be doing sort of a book feature. We're going to talk about PCAL. We're going to talk about all these different books and anything you can throw in there that's, you know, off the wall that no one is looking at from you know fiction yeah. to fact and let's get people back in books there's no advertisement you can't be influenced <laughs> you can be influenced you by can. a book but you've not got your attention span going you, uh, you've not got this is true <laughs> this is very true yeah. you don't have this, 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 this accessible distraction yeah. well, it's a form of meditation in a lot of ways you, you know what I mean I can't remember who said it but uh, re- reading is looking at dead trees and hallucinating <laughs> Oh, you're smelling them rotting as you know, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, the experience of a book as well, because what you're doing is you're deliberately holding something in a point where you have to you have to sit to read. Reading yeah. is a deliberate... If you're choosing, like, recre- recreational reading, is it right? Oh, right. It's not medical reading. You're going you know, to get you know, your little nook, you're going to get your hot drink, and you're going you're gonna to be in your spot, you know what I mean? And that that... In and of itself is stress reducing. You're gonna you're gonna reduce inflammation in the body. You're gonna lower the heart rate. Yeah. You know it's gonna increase your immunity. It's, it's just gonna boost your body to just do and feel fucking better. Yeah. And yeah, I, w- I would love in any which way I could to sort of uh, to help um, and be involved in that because I'm I'm an avid reader. I haven't so much recently because my I run through my mental health. But then the more I'm reading now again i'm strengthening that sort of muscle as it were to not then choose the escapism because ultimately social media it's the same mechanism as drugs yeah. we're seeing the same it's the same thing it's just that dopamine it's just that we're not taking the drug away at any point ever we're just going to fill it with other things until we yeah. make real life outside them fucking windows better than what these things can show us yeah we're going to choose this every time and i think that's that's going to lead us into some very dangerous places most of the commons, I mean, 100 years ago, most of the, the land was, was public. It was accessible. It was yeah. shit for us. It, it was multi-purpose, usable. Nowadays, everything is private. And it's, we're moving towards the American system of loitering. So you can't be somewhere without spending money. That's all loitering is, is you can't be in, the, in public without spending money. I still try living in London, mate. Can't go outside oh, the door without spending 20 man, fucking quid. Yeah. I have to not think about this. And it's like this health passport thing. Uh, I've got nothing again. I'm not anti-vaccine. And if you want the vaccine, that's fair enough. It's pro-choice. 
but I need to have the choice to say that I don't want that and I don't want to be questioned for that and I don't want to turn up somewhere and feel that I'm not allowed in somewhere because I've questioned some medicine that I've been told mm -hmm. to be taking. That worries me and worries me a lot. We, we, and... we, have, we have fundamental protections after the Second World War against mandatory vaccination, against... Yeah. Um, any government or any institution being able to forcibly put anything in anybody. And that's regardless of any conspiracy or opinion on this. Mm. Ultimately, I believe that if you look at any other inoculation, anything else that we've, we've dealt with previously, um, <clears throat> you can be a conscientious objector. You can, it's voluntary. And I don't think that we should create this social stigma and shame which is effectively what the government are doing. It's a PR campaign yeah. to, yes. for, 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 for the non-conformists to be bullied into the party line, yeah. as it were. And, but it, and it, that's sorry. not who we are. That's not who we are as a country. It, it's back to this this categorization. You're you're this you're this way. You're that way. You know, in these absolutes. Well, here's here's a, here's a, here's a but here's a here's a very valid fucking position to hold. Yeah, skeptical of anything newly newly created, especially pharmaceutical um, wise, until proper fucking uh, a term has passed and information has come back that is not uh oh you're anti-vax or you're not this do you know what i mean you that is a perfectly valid position to hold kind of go hmm do you know what if you want to go first you go first i'll wait just just a while just a while i'll see what's happening i'll see what's happening and then I'll make an informed decision and I'm not going to go which way or the other. So do you know mm. what I mean? That is a perfect place to be. And that's for, perfectly fine to be to be in that place. And it doesn't put you in either category, even if people will fucking tell you that it does because you're non-conformist to categorical fucking preference. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> good good no. run, brother. Good run. No, it's Definitely. Just, you know. I'm there with you and, it, and it, it, it's... It's as you say, being made feel guilty for asking questions, and, and not not. Uh, what is wrong with asking a question about this? Why 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 am I being made to be the bad person because I'm just asking? I'm uh, I'm not pro or against. Just I need a bit more information. Shut here. up and eat your medicine. Yeah, <laughs> it's classic, isn't it? It's yeah. it's, it's the same sort of mentality as you for uh, what you hit at first which was somebody giving you something because they were told that this is what you need to do in this situation. And it's the same mentality. It's like literally shut up and eat your medicine. I've been told that this is good. Here, take it. And but, oh, don't ask me fucking questions because I don't have time for it. I only have half an hour. <laughs> the, the, this is, um, I feel that what is happening currently is emblematic of a problem that we have as a global culture. And that is... <laughs> rather than addressing why things occur, we simply wish to plaster a sticker on it and let it continue. And I think ultimately, if this pandemic has arisen at any point, I don't believe in fate or any sort of uh, incarnate God or anything like that. Um, but I, I feel that this is an opportunity, 2020 has been an opportunity for us to address some shit and to look at it. And rather than just more jobs for jobs for the boys and you know contracts for X amount of billions to yeah. Pfizer and whoever else to produce this, and then whether we end up using the fucking thing or not, I think that ultimately, why the fuck have we not been talking about nutrition? Why are we not talking about lifestyle choices? Why are we not talking about risk groups? Why are we not talking about seasonal variances in, in immunity? What, you know what I mean? Why are we not talking about the consequences on people's mental health? Why are we not talking about the 30 plus thousand people that have died from cancer because their treatments were stopped? Why, why are we not talking about any of this shit? All we're talking about is the vaccine will save us, the vaccine will save us because that's the psychological programming we have. Problem, solution. Even if the solution fucks us more than the problem, which is what lockdown has done, yep. frankly, they don't care because they have to follow this, this almost this trajectory of expectance. Do you know what I mean? That that someone is out there, daddy is out there, and he will protect us. There's no adults in the fucking world. As soon as we realize this, we're gonna fucking get somewhere. It's an illusion. We're all damaged children, neurotic as fuck, trying to figure out how to find our gratification, our place in the world, how to find meaning and purpose and love. You know what I mean? We're just until we recognize that and still just, somebody's doing it better. It doesn't matter age, it doesn't matter any of this shit. If this year has shown us anything, it's the People are fuck ups and we will fuck up. Yeah. So to put, put all of our eggs in one basket is moronic. You know what I mean? To just go that they will fix it. Who is there? We've seen who they are. They're a bunch of incompetent Etonians that are out to make billions in asset strip the country at a time when people are fucking dying. 
it's, it's, it's bollocks, man. The whole approach to this, the whole conversation and coverage of this. I mean, it's something we've deliberately tried to avoid up to this point, but I feel that <laughs> we're having quite a rational conversation about this because yeah. um, we're, we're not, uh, the, it, to whatever because degree, we're not subscribing to that fucking like, oh, yeah. I'm right and you're wrong. We're actually yeah, having it, a fucking yeah. conversation. That's why. Yeah. But if yeah. you look at the binary reality, according to them and according to the algorithms on social media, you're either anti-vax, right wing, won't wear, wear a mask That's and exactly they're trying it. to microchip us and Bill Gates is the devil. Or you're, <laughs> yes, everything is perfect and everything is fine. And let's all clap for the NHS. Yeah, that's so, it, yeah. no, there's, a, there's a spectrum of a country in the middle that we're fucking missing yeah. here. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that is the majority of the population. And we're all just going, I don't know what to do. Should I wear this? Should I do this? <laughs> Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah, but, but again, there's not a conversation about developing your own stronger immunity, about vitamins, about minerals, about basic exercise. You know what I mean? About yeah. lowering cholesterol and fat. You know what I mean? It's basically what diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. They are three key factors. But if that's A. not representative of a broken educational uh, system and a you know a, a very capital capital based capitalism based one wrong sentence gives a fuck you get the point <laughs> right but you see that my point right because it's a basic thing it's food it's fucking vitamins and stuff like that right we're in 20 fucking 20 and you're telling me that like there it, it isn't actually in my hand accessible that <clears throat> you know every single bit of food um how can i say this better I, i've got to think about this a second what I want to see, basically, is a super efficient system where every molecule, every, every, you know, little bit of fucking vitamins or whatever it, the actual food breakdown is, is fully available and there to, for people to actually go to, to have um, a really sort of um, decadent um, pro-choice when it terms to when it comes to sort of reinforcing their, themselves via nutrition. I'm getting really hot because I, I almost almost lost that one. Um, but what I'm saying to you is, can you like, here's the thing. We're still faffing around where you're a, you're a doctor, um, like a GP or whatever, doesn't ask you about what you fucking eat. Do you know that kind of way? Yeah. Because, 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 do you know what I mean? Because it's, but here's the thing. With applied technology, all of that could be done in, a, in such a handy fucking way. And everybody could have you know, a choice. Oh, I'm going to eat these chocolate chip banana fucking pancakes over there because I know that that's, you know that fits in with everything now we have that information but it's all out here it's not it's not right it's not optimized it's not efficient and it's not efficient because it's representative it's representative oh, of, of a broken fucking system where we use automation for capitalistic gains instead of actually making people's lives better fucking hell I that was a I, I don't think it's broken I think it's it is been <laughs> I think no and well it's from our perspective yes from the venture capitalists that are making billions oh, of this every year. Fair enough. It's it's very much yeah, fucking working. Okay. Contextually <laughs> broken then. <laughs> I, none of my doctors have ever asked me about my diet or anything to do with that affecting my epilepsy. Never. Never but they can't paint in that, can they? Uh, There's yeah. no money. But it's it's also about specialization though, Callie, isn't it? Though? Cause if you think about it, your GP is not a nutritionalist. He was ba he's, he's a drug dealer. If you look at what a, G a modern GP <laughs> is, I'm sorry, they're a drug yeah. dealer. They're yeah. trained about yeah. all the parts, enough of the generic of the body, then given a list of pills that they can fucking yeah. give to people. And then they go, which one? That, 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 that'll do. And we're now at a point in this country that if you don't get a prescription having left a doctor, most people go, well, that didn't help. He whereas, was useless. That doctor was useless. He gave me nothing. Yeah, whereas he might have actually just been smart enough to go, you've got a slight problem now. You're not depressed. I'm not going to give you an SSRI yeah, that's going to yeah. irrecoverably change yeah. your neurological chemistry. I'm going to suggest to you, like one of my doctors did one time, you try gardening. You know what I mean? It was, the, it was kind of condescending at the time, but the, when I've looked at it, the more I looked at it yeah. in retrospect, was that guy going, I've looked at the shit they've tried to give you and the shit that you've taken and gone, I can't do any fucking better, nor do I want to do any worse. And he actually tried to deal with me on a human level. There you so go. What, and it, it, but again, he wasn't a nutritionist, so we have sort of avoided diet. If he just had to eat well, because he, he doesn't know what well is. Most of the doctors you see are obese themselves or are suffering some yeah. sort of. It's we're in such a warped system that again, because of compartmentalized spe specialization, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So this is why GPs don't know about an endocannabinoid system because the way they've built the system, they don't need to. They don't want them to. 
Because if they did, they would have far more conversations about exercise. The first conversation when a person turns up depressed with the doctor is, should be, how are you sleeping? How are you eating? Any trauma or death recently in your life? You, you know what I mean? How's your job? Taking any drugs? Yeah, stress with a wife? You know, just... Yeah. Did you just how much were you drinking? Yeah, all of these things. But the, it's not It's not even considered. You know what I mean? Some of them these days, they're getting better with it. I must yeah. admit, it's the, I've seen some with the caffeine. When you go in with anxiety, the NHS are now going, hmm, are you drinking a lot of caffeine? Which, yes, there is a correlation there. But yeah. then, again, trying to then take away a drug from somebody who that's probably not the... Uh, the creator of that anxiety it's just something that they use Heightened to pacify which yeah. it's a weird it's or a weird way in the same way that you use amphetamine for people that are hyperactive do, do you know what i mean so i drink coffee and i don't get high off coffee if i'm in a binge and i need to write coffee focuses is, and but it doesn't give me sort of the effect of it do, do you know what i mean yeah, people I take drugs in different ways or yeah. their body and, and they affect the people differently yeah. i mean something that is changing now is people don't look at mental health as needing a service People take the car for a service because the brakes need maintaining, but they don't look at the mental health in that same way. And I'd encourage anyone to go and see a counsellor. It helped me tremendously to deal with everything. And even just going for a top up, just to talk out your problems, dump those problems there and or get it out of you. And it isn't, it's just something you're always going to have to do. And it's a maintenance and it's a service thing. And I think we need to look at that because once you sort yeah. this out, usually the symptoms disappear because the symptoms are a lot of psychosomatic coming from up here and it's the stress that's covered them. All of my fits are stress related. That's what yeah. it's to do with. And stress levels go up, boom, I hit the deck. And we need to, doctors need to look at that more and look at the triggers. You mentioned the word triggers earlier. Nobody, what do you mean triggers? Nothing triggers, it happens. Well, no, no. there's a cause. Cause and effect, everything in the universe is cause and effect. Yeah, and looking at that, not just thinking, we've all been programmed, take a pill. Take a pill, it will cure the problem. And that's what we've been programmed from young age and we need to unprogram, deprogram. Take, take, take paracetamol so you can fucking have no empathy. There's your, there's your hot take. I don't, I don't know who I heard that from, but uh, I'm almost certain that that, that paracetamol has is in, um, it actually affects your ability to empathise with yeah. prolonged with prolonged use. Yeah, it oh, numbs you. Would, 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 wouldn't surprise me. There was uh, obviously That's what I heard. about about ibuprofen uh, released in the past few years. I'm not uh, a chemist. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't, don't know about paracetamol well, um, I did a whole project on ibuprofen was it ibuprofen I might have got that wrong then it might no, have been I'm ibuprofen not, I'm, I'm not no I'm not saying it is ibuprofen I'm saying that there was I can't remember the details of there's something came out about ibuprofen in the past couple of years which basically said that uh, what is it prolonged use increases um, inflammation rather than reducing it is that right mm, go with that because a lot of it's in your stomach you've got interleukin 1 that it inhibits and in your stomach, and your stomach's connected to your brain, and all of them are. What you're putting into your body is what you're going to, you know, come out. I know yeah. when I eat a load of crap, I'm going to feel like crap for days. Well, I, th I think it's exogenous consumption affects endogenous production. So we're ha there's a conversation being had around in cannabis for a while now about uh, serotonin sensitivity. So then does persistent use of, of cannabis sort of affect serotonin, dopamine, or other neurological uh, chemical drivers? Um, because then if you're producing in, in larger amounts, you, um, or rather you're consuming exogenous and your body then is taking the exogenous rather than producing its own, it means that you then start to produce your own. If then the theory is, does that then cause a weakness over time? So then it's like atrophy. Do you then atrophy that system from then working? So if you were to stop, would it reoccur? I mean, we're learning a lot more about sort of cannabis as a neuroprotectant, uh, cannabis with uh, ability for neurogenesis. Same with mushrooms and LSD, quite a lot of the psychedelic compounds unbelievable for, for the for the body and for cell cell development and especially for things that cause but they used to call it um what was it hemispheric connectivity in the brain like lsd mm. just it just lights every fucking thing up and in that process it, it helps clear out just just literally so much so much crap well we've not even touched on dmt yet Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Have you have you done DMT? <laughs> I, I had a life changing experience two years on, ago, just completely and utterly life changing. Just I knew what my mission was. Didn't speak to God, but it it completely changed my perspective on life, and is probably a big reason why again I'm sat here talking to you guys yeah. because it it really did. 
I, I came away from that tent a different person, having had an out of body experience and just this clarity. It was bizarre. It was, but never go looking for it. It will find you when you need it. And that, and I always say this to everyone every time. And it does worry me about worry me a little bit about this whole kind of psychedelic side coming on that people are looking at it for the next, it has been the next big fix and are looking to that instead of looking to within themselves to say, yeah. well, actually I can deal with these problems. It, it can help, but I also know it can cause a lot of other problems as well. And I know. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Uh, we are back once again uh, with Dr. Callie Seaman. I've only got a couple more questions, so I'm going to keep you a little bit longer. Um, so I think it's pretty obvious for anybody who looks around the industry that it's quite heavily male-dominated, um, as in there are more men than women. I don't mean in the sense of whatever the connotations of the term could be. Um, but only how, how, how do you find it being uh, a woman in, in sort of a male-dominated industry? At the start, it used to intimidate me a lot. At the start, I was very, um, I was treated a bit like, well, I was once asked at a show, are you the t-shirt girl? Yeah, yeah, because you'd Bumpy really- you made him feel small. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. That, that, that's one of the things, oh, you, back in my 20s, I, I was very shy, kept myself to myself. In the 30s, I became a lot more outspoken and a lot more standing up for myself. I actually love working with men. You're a lot simpler creatures, if I'm honest. You're black and white, right? You mean what you say. The word fine doesn't mean <laughs> the farthest thing away from it. You genuinely ask, well, if there's something wrong, you'll, you'll say something. And, and you'll have a bit of a, a, a tussle, and a bit of shout, and then it's all okay. Women, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard work. So I actually do prefer working with men. Um, and I do, I do, it does empower me. I've always just been one of the boys. I've always, you know, got down and done all the dirty work with them. There's not one job in our place that I wouldn't ask anyone to do that I wouldn't do myself. Um, mm. So I've, I've never really struggled with it, but I, I suppose I've got a strong mum. She's, she's a little five foot skinhead who's never took any shit off anyone. <laughs> um, so this, as I say, it's never been a problem. There's some, You've had your circles of like boys clubs, but who I work with, uh, aquaculture, aqua, aquaculture, aqua labs now, because we came from aquaculture, um, are fantastic. I'm treated as an equal, um, but it's just you've got, to, you've got to stand up for yourself. You've got to say you've got that metaphorical 13 inch cock, and when you walk in the room, make sure everyone knows. <laughs> Swing it around. Uh, uh, and do you do, do you do that by walking like John Wayne? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a full ball helicopter. Man. <laughs> you know, if we're coming and we're doing it proper, uh, and 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 just be loud and bold, and it it, it. Sometimes it scares some people. It scares the shit out of some. Um, I'm a bit marmite. People either hate me or love me. Um, well, I and, love you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> love that. All 13 inches. <laughs> <laughs> Walked into that one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but you crawled into it. <sighs> we'll not get the swap figure out, don't we? <laughs> um, but no, it, it, it's. I'd encourage more women to go into it. I'd encourage more. I, I, I'm trying to big up more women. I mean, there's a fantastic group, Women of Weed UK, fantastic bunch. They really are so supportive. They've helped so much through this lockdown period. Of all the women that are similar to me, there's mums in there. There's there's other you know consumers. There's and you're not made to feel ashamed of anything you do. No questions, stupid. Yeah. So it, it is changing. Um, I, I've enjoyed actually being the only woman, as I say, because you, you're something different. You're something people go, oh, what she got to say, oh, oh, mm. oh. And as I say, this going into my 40s, I'm becoming a battle axe now. I'm going to really show them it. <laughs> oh, all all poets here. Um, so just a slight sort of side question on that. What then, for any of our female listeners or viewers out there that are interested in getting in the industry, um, what's the, what sort of steps can they take? What What's a good sort of uh, route for them if they haven't obviously got a PhD? Um, what other routes could you suggest? 
How would you get some business knowledge? That's something I lacked in. I really wish I'd have understood basic things about, you know, tax and uh, how to set up businesses. The the whole basic kind of, t- you know, what what rent is, what uh, you know, um, GDP, not GDPR. Um, oh, there's all these letters that I end up sitting in the accounts going. <coughs> What, what number am I looking at? I, I, don't, I don't know what this is. Oh, that's rent, yeah. That's how much you're paying on, that's how much you're paying on wages. Uh, uh, that kind of, I would highly recommend. So you've got that business knowledge of understanding how a business runs, how to have a successful business and keep it going. Um, those are the kinds of things I'd understand better. Um, do what, what drives you. Do what you enjoy. I mean, it was always a passion of me, and I've got my dream job now. I get to go around legal cannabis farms and help them to produce better crops and do research on it. I, I, I couldn't ask for a better job. Um, I love it. I absolutely love it. And the people I meet um, get a good team as well, people you trust. I mean, everybody I've got working with me, I mean, dad works for me, my husband works for me, um, everyone is kind of related a bit and it's about trust. So build a team that you trust. That is number one, um, big thing. Excellent, excellent. Nice. Uh, well, I suppose uh, we'll end on a bit of more of a positive note compared to some of the content maybe. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, say we've it more, asked... say, it, say it better than that. You can't go down and be reluctant about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not been that negative. <laughs> Uh, we know, yeah, you're right. No, I'm just just thinking. So some people may sort of tear away. No, nah, okay. p- p- people people take it how they take it. And ultimately, I think this has been a really good podcast. We've covered a diversity of brilliant. subjects, so I hope people have really enjoyed it. Um, really do as always. Uh, so we'll ask our final questions. This is something me and Matt came up with, uh, just to sort of end on a lighter note. And it is uh, give us something good that's happened in 2020. It's been a pretty shit year for a lot of people. And uh, we're just asking our guests to tell us something that has been good in their lives this year. Well, you know that 13-inch dick I spoke about? <laughs> I grew a set of balls with it, is what I did during 2020. I grew a set of balls and decided to talk, to talk about George. And anyone who's seen my Instagram, George, is what I give the name to my epilepsy. So I'm talking more openly about that to help others. And sharing my experiences and how I've dealt with some of it that's been happening and grown balls to talk out about my consumption and try and change the stigma. That's that's the good thing that's come out of it. And I'm, I'm coming on podcasts like this, not just doing the prim and pop thing. We need to do testing. And with the testing, we use a HPLC uh, coupled with a mass spectrometer. No, let's, mm. let's, talk about, let's talk about really what's going off inside my head. And that's, I think, the, the best thing that's come out of it. Um, that's what I feel from 2020 it's a bit like the drink really 2020 just get it down as quick as you can (laughs) try not to throw up (laughs) snake bite yeah (laughs) (laughs) worst Um, ever uh, brilliant possibly one of the best answers we've had so far Uh, I think so yeah I think definitely the best analogy we've had in the show 100% I'm dying laughing at that good amazing (laughs) I've not said I'll wipe it in your hair when I'm doing it. Oh, hell. You may be able to get it. I love it. Love and bird. I'm from Sheffield. Love it. (laughs) I got no airs and graces. I very much look forward to having you as a guest again in the future, Callie. Oh, God. Um, Yeah, but, but this is exactly why I've created this platform is I don't just want the crap that we feel that people will accept us for. I don't just want your work and your polished end product. I want to see you. I want to hear about your life, your motivations, your reasons for being who you are and what you do. You know what I mean? I've named this the simple life because I'm trying to discover what the hell my life means and what I'm doing. Because I've just been mindlessly running through activism for the past few years, talking to anybody that'll listen and shouting to anybody that'll gather around a microphone. Um, to, To, yeah, try and explore the humans behind this because we can all find the commonality. And ultimately, I hope that a lot of the viewers and listeners to this um, will have taken a lot of you away from this, if you know what I mean. I hope so, that I'm not just that stuffy scientist. That... <laughs> no, definitely not. 
not at all. Not at all. I don't think anybody will have got that impression from listening to this today. <laughs> I need to smoke. <laughs> well, we're we're just about done. We'll do pleasantries. Um, just before, so, I just cut you off. Sorry, I'm, I've been doing that all night. Get used to it, Simba. Um, I'm just showing people at home the uh, Instagram. So it's Doctor Dot Cali Seaman. That'd be the one. That'd be the one. Yeah. Um, and that's on Instagram. And also, you can check out just to mention our Patreon page as well, which is three pound or five pound a month, which is uh, <clears throat> the price of a coffee, just to keep support us and keep us going. Over to you, Simba, for your old pleasantries. For our patrons, actually, for that low, low price, you get early access to all episodes, you get early access to blogs, as well as being able to provide questions for future guests. So well worth your pennies. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, uh, Cali. Been a pleasure. Um, I look forward, to, like I said, to have you a future guest and to see as your balls get bigger, just what comes, <laughs> just what comes out. Um, so as always, guys, if you're watching or listening to this, whatever platform we are now on Spotify, you'll probably be hearing us on Google and Apple Podcasts as well by the time this is out. So please do check us out across all sorts subscribe, of media. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. That as well. <laughs> At The Simple Life, everywhere online, guys. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And catch you later, folks. Bye. Peace.